Good evening, everybody. We're just about to begin. I'll give Simon an opportunity to grab his chair. <laughs> Didn't mean to embarrass you. So we will uh, begin this meeting. We have no public meetings tonight. We have two issues on our regular agenda. Uh, I'll call this meeting to order. A uh, mover and a seconder for the agenda. Thank you, Councillor Hill. Thank you, Councillor Osanek. All the, yeah, uh, with the adits. I always forget to say that. With the adits. All those in favor? Carried. Uh, confirmation of minutes from our November seventh. We've all been. They've all been circulated to us. So, if there's any questions or comments. If not, a mover and a seconder. Uh, thank you, Councillor Chappelle. Thank you, Councillor Kiley. All those in favor? Carried. Disclosure of pecuniary interest? Seeing none. Uh, confirmation of minutes? I'm sorry. Delegations? Uh, seeing none. Briefing? Seeing none. I'll read the brief uh, business portion since both of our files tonight, there'll be an opportunity for community input. Uh, this portion of the meeting is open to the public. The city has initi initiated a new process in which members of the public will have an opportunity to speak for up to five minutes on comprehensive reports presented before the planning committee. Those wishing to provide oral comments at this meeting will be invited to do so. If a person or public body would otherwise have an ability to appeal the decision of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston to the local planning tribunal, uh, appeal tribunal, but the person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Kingston before the bylaw is passed, that person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision there is an opportunity to sign up on a sheet at the back of the room, which also gives you standing. So we'll move right into our first uh, issue tonight, which is for 85 First Avenue. Good evening, members of the uh, planning committee, members of the public. Uh, so this is um, an application at 85 First Avenue, uh, which is the uh, former First Avenue Public School. So the purpose and effect of the meeting tonight is to amend the one-family dwelling and two-family dwelling zone A5, uh, which is a residential zone, to permit the development of 24 residential lots, and that will ultimately result in the development of 70 residential units. Uh, so the, the, what's being sought in terms of zoning relief, uh, I've broken out here into um, uh, relief for the principal dwelling, which uh, has to do with projections into uh, yards and the minimum front yard setback, uh, minimum lot area required, the minimum lot width, and the minimum driveway width. And then uh, the relief associated with the accessory building, which has to do with the minimum side yard required. Uh, maximum height of the accessory building, lot coverage for accessory building, location of the detached accessory building, uh, accessory buildings including residential units, and accessory buildings located at the rear of other buildings and not fronting on the street. Uh, so the, the 24 residential lots ultimately, uh, uh, they, they've initially been created. Uh, it, there's actually a plan of subdivision that dates back to 1914 that uh, established the 24 residential lots. Uh, so this is the, the site in question between Kings Court and Nelson, just north of First Avenue. There's a neighborhood context photo. It's designated residential in the official plan. And there's the zoning A5 zone. And again, the A5 zone permits a range of residential uses and, and community uses as well. And it, permit, it permits currently uh, one and two family dwellings. So this is a site plan of the proposed development. Uh, you can see that the, uh, uh, 
the proposal has a number of single detached dwellings uh, fairly close to the street and staggered in terms of their setbacks. And along the rear of the, uh, the properties are uh, attached garages, each of which, uh, each of those attached garages would be, is proposed to uh, accommodate a two car garage on the bottom and uh, an accessory unit on the upper floor. These are some photos of the site as it is right now. The, the school's been demolished, so it's essentially a vacant site right now. And the, uh, the, the streets surrounding uh, are primarily uh, single detached dwellings with associated accessory buildings as well. So in terms of the zoning for the, the principal dwelling, uh, the intent is, um, well, the, the three dwellings uh, on the 23 lots has to do with, uh, there's one lot that uh, is not being considered for having three uh, residential units, but the other uh, 23 lots are all proposed to have three residential units, one in the principal dwelling, one in the basement of the principal dwelling, and then one in the upper floor of the accessory building. And so um, in terms of what's being sought, currently there's a, a requirement for 370 square meters of minimum lot area per unit and uh, the reduction being sought is to 100 square, 120 square meters per unit for the three units. So that's 360 uh, square meters total. Uh, there's a reduction being sought for the minimum front yard to three meters, which is uh, in keeping with the character of the, the streetscape. Uh, in addition, there is a permission being sought to reduce uh, the front yard setback specifically for the front steps to 1.5 meters to allow that to project into the front yard. Um, the, the reduction for the corner side yard is to 1.2 meters. That's along uh, First Avenue. Uh, and again, the, the lot area I have discussed. Um, the minimum lot width is uh, established already at nine meters, so it's effectively to permit the, the previously established plan of subdivision lot size. They are not proposing to uh, amend the existing uh, lot size. And the, uh, the three meter wide shared driveway uh, is a feature uh, that um, combines the driveways, which means that there will be additional potential for on-street parking, and the two uh, driveways combined to a single drive uh, shared uh, is for access to both the, the, the garages in behind as well as the residential uh, units. So the uh, zoning revisions proposed for the uh, accessory building have to do with including that, um, the residential dwelling unit in the accessory building in the rear, increasing the height to seven and a half meters uh, to allow for sufficient uh, living space for that unit, uh, increasing the maximum lot coverage to 15%, uh, decreasing that rear yard setback to 0.8 meters, which creates still a space in behind the homes from, a, or from the accessory building for a maintenance perspective, but uh, increases the amount of amenity area in front of the uh, accessory building, and decreasing the interior side yard setback to zero meters, which is because the uh, the garage, uh, the two accessory buildings side by each have a, effectively a zero lot line because they're semi-detached. So we received uh, a number of comments through um, correspondence and through the previous public meeting. Uh, I'm gonna highlight the, the feedback that we received in the response. So there was concern uh, regarding, in general terms, the population, the unit types, and the affordability, questions about it. Uh, and so, um, the, the proposal as uh, we see it today, uh, it uh, meets the criteria from the official plan for medium density residential development. And uh, the, the, the built form that's being proposed is in keeping with uh, the neighborhood context in terms of the single detached dwellings and the accessory buildings. And uh, in terms of concern about potential disruption, this as all areas of the city is subject to the, uh, the noise bylaws. Uh, there's a comment about the number of bedrooms per type, and as per the developer, um, our understanding is that the proposal is for there to be a, a three-bedroom unit in the principal dwelling with a one-bedroom unit below the principal dwelling and a one-bedroom unit in the accessory building. Uh, regarding the affordability of units, um, the uh, lots are to be sold to individual homeowners who will uh, subsequently determine what they want to do with those units, so it's possible that the units will be used by family members, it's possible they will be rented to the members of the community. Ultimately, it will be the decision of the homeowner in the future. In terms of the building's design, there were uh, comments regarding uh, concern about uh, having uh, adequate living space and the orientation of entrances. Um, in this instance, um, 
the, uh, there's, pr there's private amenity and both outdoor and indoor amenity space being provided for all the units uh, that was considered sufficient. And uh, the, the, the primary, the principal residence is, is facing the street, uh, as you would uh, generally expect. The, uh, se the second um, unit faces to the drive where there is a walkway to ensure that there is safe pedestrian access to the rear of the property. And the third unit in the, uh, in the accessory building uh, would have an entranceway facing forward as well towards the street. Uh, there was concern about the building designs uh, in terms of uh, variety and variability in the design. Uh, the, um, the developers said that um, the home buyers are going to have a choice in the interior and exterior of the buildings, but that uh, generally speaking, they have a commitment to making sure that there aren't identical buildings side by side, and so they would also like to see that variety. Uh, there's concern about dis construction disturbance through jackhammering and blasting, which again, uh, the developers indicated uh, they would like to keep to a minimum, uh, but it will potentially be happening where there's uh, servicing requirements. Uh, there were questions about universal accessibility and the potential for visitor suites, and in both instances, uh, well, for starters, in terms of universal accessibility, um, that will be done to meet the Ontario Building Code at a minimum, and uh, in terms of visitor suites, that is uh, subject to the desires and future of the, uh, of the future homeowners. There was a comment regarding public spaces and amenities in the vicinity of this site. Uh, so the, the minimum uh, requirements in terms of open space, landscape open space and, and amenity are met or exceeded by what's being proposed in the development. Uh, and um, there are several parks in proximity to this site, including Third Avenue Park, the Ron Lavallee Park, and also the Memorial Center. Uh, in terms of amenities, uh, there was concern about there not being very many amenities, uh, such as shopping or laundry nearby. Uh, there is a neighborhood commercial store directly adjacent to the site, but in addition to that, um, the, the downtown is within walking distance, as is the Kingston Center as well, uh, so there are fair, uh, a bit of amenity uh, available there. Uh, there was concern about um, on-street parking and uh, the potential for increased traffic. Uh, due to the number of units being proposed, um, it was uh, uh, deemed that a traffic impact study would not be required for this potential proposal. And um, uh, the, in terms of, again, on-street parking, as I mentioned earlier, um, by co-locating the uh, driveways as a shared driveway, it does actually create uh, more potential for on-street parking than it would if every individual unit had its own driveway. Um, and uh, in terms of parking space provision, uh, we have a requirement for, that the zoning bylaw requires one parking space per unit being proposed, and that is being met by the uh, applicant. Um, the allocation is, however, done by, uh, at the discretion of the owner in future. We don't have a mechanism to mandate um, how the parking is particularly distributed on the site. In terms of servicing, uh, there was a comment about uh, risk of the units flooding, and um, uh, the engineering department uh, and the building services department as well uh, uh, have, um, will be ensuring that stormwater management is provided for all, for all units. And um, regarding the provision of servicing to the site, um, it's been reviewed uh, by a qualified professional and by Utilities Kingston, and it's been deemed that adequate infrastructure is there to provide uh, services for the site. So in summary, uh, the provincial policy statement uh, supports residential intensification of the type that we are seeing uh, demonstrated at this site. Now, the area, as I mentioned, is designated residential, which permits a wide range of residential uses, such as what we're seeing. And the, uh, our official plan policies uh, promote appropriate intensification, uh, residential intensification, which again, we are seeing being uh, uh, carried out here. Um, the proposed zoning is gonna be a site-specific zone for these particular lots, two specifically, actually, to uh, account for the, uh, the slight idiosyncrasies of the, the one separate um, lot. And um, the relief that is being uh, proposed uh, in terms of both the principal dwelling unit, well, the, for the principal dwelling unit, it relates mainly to a uh, desire to both accommodate the, the dwelling, but also to meet the character of the surrounding area in terms of the variability and setbacks, et cetera. And the uh, accessory building uh, relief is 
effectively related to that incorporation of a residential unit in a detached building, which is something that uh, has not been commonly done. Uh, beyond that, uh, the servicing uh, and other technical elements have been confirmed by our, our partner organizations. So in summary, this is to permit that development of the 24 residential lots, resulting in a total of 70 residential units for the uh, zoning relief that I've laid out. Uh, the proposed zoning amendment, it complies with the, uh, the PPS and our official plan, and we believe it constitutes uh, good land use planning, and so we recommend approval of the application. Thank you. Um, staff wish to comment on the, the process uh, as far as notifying the adequate area. The, sorry, specifically refining the development? Yeah. Or? Um, one of the, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, one of the refinements that has been made uh, has to do with uh, increasing the amount of amenity area and decreasing the amount of um, uh, asphalt impermeable surface. From the initial concept, that was one of the things that we were trying to do is ensure that the, um, that the character of the development would be um, in keeping with the surrounding area, but also trying to minimize impacts from a stormwater perspective and increase um, the livability of the units for future residents as well. Great. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I'll turn to the committee now. And um, the process is that the committee have an opportunity to ask questions, but before the recommendation goes on the floor, is moved and seconded, the public will have an opportunity uh, to seek clarification or make comments. Okay? So I'm tur now turning to the committee. If there are any questions, yes. Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Mr. Through you. Thanks for the question about the front yard setback. In our package, it said you're requesting from 7.5 to 3. And then in your presentation, I think you mentioned that most of that is because of stairs protruding out. Could you just confirm that? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the required setback is 7.5 meters. And the reduction to 3 meters has to do with the placement of the, the front wall of the dwelling. And then, so what they're proposing is to have the front wall of the dwelling at a minimum of three meters. Some will be uh, greater than that in terms of setback, like four, whatnot. But the uh, one and a half meter setback has to do with the protrusion of the front steps. So we have an allowance for projections into yards uh, for uh, steps and other similar architectural features. And that is what's being sought in terms of that reduction. So the mm -hmm. front face of the building would be at three meters and it's only the projection that would go closer. And would those front-facing walls be much ahead of adjacent dwellings? Like if you were to line up the other buildings on the street, would they be much further out? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the, the intent of the front yard setback was specifically to uh, line up the buildings Perfect. in that okay. neighborhood. Uh, the required setback actually of uh, seven and a half meters, uh, and there are other areas in, this, uh, uh, in the Kings Court neighborhood where uh, kind of a minimum of six meters is required. It actually creates a situation where, uh, in order to be more in keeping with the context of the neighborhood, someone might require zoning relief. So this is, I think, going further to uh, creating a, a better neighborhood context. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any further questions? Uh, seeing none, uh, would you kindly, Chair? Take the chair and recommend. Thank you. Um, a couple of things. I appreciate that there's additional green space from the original design. Uh, I believe that's what you said. Um, I know that you mentioned parks in the neighborhood. And often I scold planners and developers who try to point out parks because those are neighborhood amenities. And there is a, an amenity obligation to developers. Do you, I presume you aren't asking for relief on outdoor amenity space or green space uh, for the units. Is that accurate? I guess it'd be through you, Mr. Chair. Um, that's correct. Relief is not being sought for amenity space. Uh, to note, uh, just one, I guess, a minor detail there. So the maximum lot coverage is being increased for the accessory building but that doesn't translate into um, the amount of required uh, green space being diminished in this instance. It's still exceeding the requirements in the zoning bylaw in terms of private outdoor amenity space. 
So they do have more than the required landscape open space. Thank you. And two other things that often come up uh, with developments, uh, and this has to do with uh, uh, issues around environment and such. Are, uh, is it possible for the developer to use permeable uh, hard surface uh, so that there's better drainage uh, within? I know it's m marginally more expensive to use the permeable hard surface, but is that a consideration that is possible? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, that was raised at the public meeting and uh, I think that, um, well, I, I can't speak for the developer, but I can say that at the previous meeting, they'd indicated that uh, per, uh, permeable uh, surfaces were contemplated and were not considered feasible by them. It would be a preference from our perspective uh, to have increased permeable surface in general on a site from a stormwater consideration uh, perspective. Uh, however, that um, isn't, the material isn't something that we would uh, mandate specifically. Yeah. And we have made efforts to reduce the amount of- And I understand surface. that that would be part of the site plan process. Uh, so perhaps that can be- Through you, Mr. Chair, in fact, there is no site cool. plan process for yeah, this particular application right. given the number of units per lot. You're right, I made that comment last time. I forgot that there isn't site plan for the subdivisions. Um, Oh, is there, an, I think this came up at the public meeting as well, is there an opportunity or a commitment for each three unit location to have an EV charger for electric vehicles? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, that's I think um, a consideration that I would imagine that the developer would consider on a lot by lot basis at the, at the desire of the future homeowner. I think, again, that's something that we would see as favorable, but it's um, not something that we would normally um, require at this yeah. point. Because it's the kind of thing that's less costly if it's done at the time of construction. Agreed. So clearly. OK. Thank you. You can have the chair back. Thank you very much. Uh, no other members of the committee wish to make comment? Oh, sorry. You snuck up on me. Uh, the, the district councillor always has an opportunity to make comments and ask questions. Uh, no matter how much she wants to vote, um, unfortunately, she can't vote on the decision. But the floor is yours, Thank Councillor you. Holland. Thanks. Um, so I may have missed this, but the, um, the uh, relief for the amount of asphalt, you touched on it. I know that there, we were seeking a lower amount. Um, and where is that? It, where are we at with that? Through you, Mr. Chair, it's kind of a two-part answer. One is, um, just to clarify, in the, in the further design uh, refinements of the concept, we reduced the amount of asphalt that was initially being proposed by moving the parking space to a different location and, and, and relocating the garage slightly. Um, but in terms of the required uh, relief from a zoning perspective, um, the the um, what's being sought is um, a reduction effectively in terms of the driveway width because they're proposing to share a driveway. Currently, every individual lot would require to have a, a require a three meter driveway, but because they're sharing the driveway, they're seeking the zoning relief to effectively permit the sharing of that driveway. So the sharing of the driveway also reduces the impermeable surface by losing a driveway per lot. Thank you. That brings me. Yes, to my no problem. Brings me to my next question. Um, so, with the with the checks and the driveway narrowing, are there any concerns about um, snow removal with the length of the driveway and the amount of space at the back of the properties? Uh, through you, Ms. There is a fair amount of amenity space being provided, which I, I would anticipate would be used as part of that snow removal in, in future. Uh, there's room in the front, um, which is in keeping with the neighborhood in terms of the amount of snow storage space in front of the home and to the rear of the home. Again, um, as you can see, there's a, an area both to the side of the garage uh, and in front between the, uh, between the principal dwelling and the accessory building where there's a potential for snow storage as well. Okay, the, um, in the comments submitted, there was, I think, when you, you addressed the um, concerns about parking and the fact that the three 
spots will be on site is uh, is helpful. Uh, but at the previous meeting, there were comments and questions. Two two parts of this: one being um, visitors coming and parking, and the second being the um, the the narrowness the, of the of King's Court Ave. Um, the fact that it's a bus route and the fact that there is often, while well, there's parking on one side, most of the time there are often cars parked illegally. Uh, so I'm just wondering if there were, any, if there's any, any comments on the, um, on the, any, I understand no traffic study, but just that potential for congestion and um, the, mostly the obstruction of the, of the bus route. Mr. Chair. Uh, the parking uh, requirements uh, as per the zoning are being met in terms of one space per unit. And again, as I mentioned, we don't have control over how those parking spaces specifically are allocated uh, from a zoning perspective. Uh, regarding visitor parking, I would expect that there would be some visitor parking taking place on the street. However, the uh, on-street parking is effectively a, um, a common element. It's a shared community resource. Uh, and the way that this site has been designed to minimize the number of driveways, again, it's preserving the amount of on-street parking. Uh, given the, the lot fabric as proposed, were the developer uh, to decide to do so, they could proceed with 24 individual single detached dwellings with 24 individual driveways uh, without a requirement for a zoning bylaw amendment, just proceeding to a building permit. And if they did that, then there would be a greater loss of on-street parking potential. Thank you. I will now open it up to the public. Uh, there's a microphone here and a mi microphone here that you're welcome to use. Um, it's a little confusing. Red is actually on, green is off when you go to a mic. But help yourself. Uh, to, and when you go to a mic, you have five minutes. And uh, if you would kindly identify yourself, name and address. That would be great. So, is seeing no takers, I will, we will go back into the committee and we'll move and second the motion. So this is the last opportunity, going, going, gone. Uh, so we will return to the committee and uh, we need a mover and a seconder for the proposal, and then we can discuss it. Uh, Councillor Kiley, Councillor Hill. So, uh, any further comments or questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, I will call the question. All those, yes. Pardon me? Oh, okay, no problem. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now, uh, we have exactly the right number of chairs to keep the fire marshal happy. Uh, if you're standing and you're here for the, uh, the next issue, which is uh, density by design. If I could suggest, uh, if you wish, uh, the Memorial Hall is set up with a screen and there is a list. I believe people have signed the list to come in delegation. Uh, if you haven't yet signed the list, we'll put it temporarily in the back to give you an opportunity to do that. And we will begin with the presentation. So. Thank you, Chair, Planning Committee, and members of the public. Uh, I'm Paige Agnew, I'm the Director of Planning, Building, and Licensing for the City of Kingston, and I'm joined this evening by Brent Totterin, who's been working with us on this project for the last 10 months, 12 months, actually. We're gonna be talking to you tonight about density by design. This is our issues and options report 
We released this report publicly last Friday, and over the course of this week, we've had a lot of conversations already, some small group settings, larger group settings. We did have an open house that took place right before the meeting tonight. And the most important thing I can stress to you is that we will continue to have the conversations about this report over the next six weeks. This is really important work for the City of Kingston. We acknowledge the complexity. We acknowledge the amount of information there is to digest and look forward to continuing to talk to you about this work as it unfolds. So just reintroducing this project to the community, the purpose of this work is to rethink the location and design of tall and mid-rise buildings in order to best address the climate change emergency and some of our other important city priorities. So just as a reminder, this work specifically only relates to buildings that are four stories and greater. It was work that was authorized by council in March of 2019. It did involve some consultation with the community back in April and since that time we've been taking the feedback and looking at what to do with that feedback, how to allow it to inform the work that went into the issues and options report, and certainly we'll continue to do that with the feedback we received tonight and ongoing over the next six weeks. The key output of this work eventually will be new policies for the official plan and the zoning bylaw. So what's before you tonight is high level preliminary options, but we will be advancing to policy writing within 2020. Again, just stressing for the group, we're not at a decision point. We're at a project milestone where we're checking in about some of the critical thinking where we're, what, that we've been doing, sharing the detailed analysis that we've been undertaking, and looking at preliminary options and recommendations for further discussion. We really need input on this project. It's a citywide, very important document. So we are trying to encourage as many people to come to the conversation as possible and to really challenge the work so that at the end of the day we have a plan for Kingston that Kingston can really embrace. Why this work is critical. Number one, we're in a climate change emergency. Our council declared a very important leadership position with respect to climate change earlier this year. And from my perspective, this work is really a call to strategic action related to land use and climate change. The actions that we have taken enable us to focus on getting work done uh, from a development perspective right and fast. So we're gonna talk to you about that through the process, what we mean by right, and then from fast, really taking into consideration the fact that we need to continue to build housing in our community because we do have a vacancy rate issue and we also have an affordability challenge. Currently, there's a lack of clarity for everyone on expectations for tall and mid-rise building design. We do have some direction currently in our official plan and zoning bylaws, but it's not sufficient for the whole city, and it's not sufficient in particular with respect to tall buildings and mid-rise buildings. We've widened the scope of this work over the last six months to include locations for height and density, so we're gonna to talk to you a little bit more about that later in the presentation. And from our opinion, this is really what's needed for the city to be able to truly walk the talk as it relates to land use planning and our climate change declaration. So just talking about the pipeline, this is the word that we use to talk about our housing supply numbers. This will give you a sense of where we were in 2017 with respect to pending. So pending, when we talk about that, it refers to the number of housing units that are currently going through development applications but have not yet come to council for decision. Our committed numbers are reflective of development applications that have resulted in new housing units for the community that have been approved by council. So we're not very much different from where we were in 2017, and we do continue to have a housing supply shortage issue. So although we do have quite a bit in the pipeline, we do need to continue to add housing to our supply in a strategic way to help us advance in terms of housing availability for the community and affordability. So our work has very much strategically evolved over the last 12 months. We started as a, as a project specifically looking at tall buildings only. Then we evolved that to look at mid-rise buildings as well because we felt the need to address both. And then it's also been evolving over the last four or five months as well to really critically start to ask the questions about the where of tall and mid-rise buildings. Originally, the work was really only looking at the how of buildings, how they need to be designed. But as recently as the issues and options report, we've started to introduce concepts related to some of the questions about the where, specifically for the downtown area and North Block. 
There have been four key lenses that have informed our work throughout the course of, of the study to date, and really, again, reinforcing the critical link between land use planning, transportation, building design, and the climate emergency. We've certainly been looking at this work through the lenses of affordability and market choice with respect to housing. We've also looked at it from the lens of really needing to understand and embrace the sense of character and place that is so important to Kingstonians and making sure that that work is reflected in the outcome of the study. And also looking at the ease of development and making sure that we're doing that in the most strategic places where we want to and, con want to and continue to uh, grow and evolve as a city from a growth management perspective. We have added a new section into our work specifically with respect to the location of height and density. Again, this was work that we intended to look at originally as a phase two after we finished the tall and mid-rise design work. We've added a portion in that now in terms of the most urgent area being the downtown and the North Block specifically. And we wanted to again explore that from the standpoint of looking at where do we want to see some of this density and strategically, where does it make sense to see density with respect to the overall city goals and in particularly around climate change? So again, a part of the study is really about making development in the right places easier and places where it's unstrategic for the city, making it more difficult to have density go there. We have developed a draft map for consultation called the Green Light Strategy and we're gonna to talk to you a little bit about that further on in the presentation. There's three critical actions related to the location of density that we've addressed in this report. It doesn't address the total issue of where, but there are three key areas and this is what we're thinking. Number one, rethinking the 40% infill target in the official plan. This is a target that was set in 2009 with respect to the first city's official plan and it represents a minimum standard for infill relative to Ontario municipalities. We haven't really looked at that number since then and as part of this work we're critically questioning is that the appropriate amount of infill given our goals with respect to smart growth and climate change. We're looking at tightening the policy and criteria currently allowing high density and tall buildings in car dependent areas. Our official plan is quite permissive in a lot of ways, restrictive in other ways, but there are abilities through the official plan right now to, that are allowing density to go in very car dependent places. So we're asking ourselves critical questions about that and the need to rethink some of that policy. And again on the green light, faster realization of allowing density and height in smart strategic areas. And again, through this by the green light strategy, it's really about exploring the barriers that exist to good development now in strategic places, and also looking at what types of incentives can the municipality explore through this process to look at making density in the right places easier and faster to accomplish. We want to be really clear about what the green light strategy isn't. It's not a new policy that increases height or density on its own. So there has been a lot of confusion this week with some of the draft mapping that we put out that that was an intend, intended visual to say this is where new height and density are going to go. That's not what the intention of it is. But what it is is a strategy that identifies and implements ways to facilitate, incent, and remove barriers to well-designed development that is permitted by the existing official plan. And I want to reinforce that. That's permitted by the existing official plan. So some of the incentives that we've been talking about, there can be taxation programs, there can be things related to development fees and charges. Uh, other tools that are in the municipality's disposal can be pre-zoning or in some cases up-zoning, so increasing entitlements related to height and density in strategic locations. So these are all tools that we're looking at as part of this process. This is a copy of the green light strategy map that we've developed and again looking at how it aligns with our strategic transit <coughs> investment so far. So the, the lines that you see with the green over top of them, those are aligned up against the express transit infrastructure investments that the city's already made. And again, from a high level, level theater, theoretical perspective, looking at how we can ensure that our density is lining up with key transit and infrastructure investments that the city has already made. And again, really trying to shift the city to multimodal living. There's a lot of really big ideas that are presented in this report. I'm going to highlight a couple for you now and Brent will talk to you about the rest in a few slides from now. But really for the first time, this report is about trying to get to a place where we have citywide design expectations that are clear for tall and mid-rise buildings. We don't have that now on a citywide basis and we very much need it. 
We're also looking at through this the idea of replacing slab buildings or very wide buildings with thinner, better designed tall and mid-rise buildings where they're currently permitted in the plan. And specifically also investigating ways to remove barriers to mid-rise and wood frame construction. Again, linking this to our goals with respect to scale and affordability in the city and then also looking at the link with climate change. As part of this work, we are doing economic analysis. There are specific things that we're investigating related to built form ideas. And before we go ahead and start writing policy, we think it's really important to understand the land economic considerations that go along with it. The last thing we want to do is go through a consultative process with the community, do a lot of important work, and then come out with policies that just aren't buildable or viable for the community. So some of the economic analysis that we're undertaking, it's underway now. We're, we're additionally adding some more over the next six or eight weeks, specifically looking at analyzing seven to nine story buildings with or without step backs, and we'll talk to you about that in a few slides. Analyzing fifth and sixth story step backs on six story buildings, looking at the North Block and CBD in terms of scenario testing for different types of form, looking at the consideration and differences that exist between rental and condominium buildings and the difference that needs to be taken into consideration with respect to design policy. And again, we're emphasizing this isn't an end all and be all in terms of economic analysis. There's a lot of things that the city needs to look at in this respect. This represents a first phase and it's very possible, um, if not probable, that we will be doing economic analysis in the phase two of this work to come. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of committee, uh, citizens of Kingston. You'll recall when we had our last phase of public engagement, we actually went uh, through some effort to educate through a series of slides and a presentation all the different elements of a building design that actually contribute to whether one might consider that building good or not, for lack of a better term. We went, and particularly to emphasize that there is more to the conversation about whether a building is well designed than just how tall it is, because one of the observations was that tended to be the focus of the conversation. Height is very important, but there are many elements. And in fact, we showed you at the time, I think about uh, 14, 13 or 14 elements of a building design and facilitated a conversation about how they all work together to determine whether or not a building is perceived uh, admittedly, potentially subject, subject, subjectively, uh, as a good design or a bad design. In fact, since then, based on the input we actually got from the public in that last round, we've added a few elements at your suggestion, and we're up to 16 different elements of how a building can be designed. Mercifully, Mr. Chair, I'm not going to take you through all 16 of them, but I am going to take you through some of the more important and, frankly, uh, challenging and controversial ones to make sure that committee understands uh, some of our thinking. Is it this one? Thank you. Uh, although I said a minute ago that height isn't the only important thing, we did start with height. And uh, uh, the ma main uh, discussion we had is whether or not it made sense to provide maximum height limits for buildings, both mid-rise and tall buildings, throughout the city. Do we think about it throughout the city? That was one of the options we, we, we looked at. And by the way, you'll note, Council or, or Committee, in the document, for each of these items, we showed our work. We showed a great deal of discussion about uh, what the options are relative to the element, uh, what our considerations were, what we heard from the public in the first round of consultation, and ultimately what we were recommending in a preliminary way and why. So frankly, everyone could see what issues we struggled with, what issues we were seeking to balance, and ultimately why we were recommending what we were recommending. As I've said to you a few times, Mr. Chair, my fourth grade math teacher always said to me, you don't get the marks if you just give the answer, you have to show your work. And we tried to do that through this document so that everyone could read it and frankly follow our thinking and tell us whether or not they agreed with our thinking or not. So in each of these slides, you'll see the options we considered. The option that is highlighted and bolded is our current preliminary recommendation. And it is just that, preliminary. It's not written in stone. Uh, and we are asking the public whether or not you agree that these are the options. Did we miss any options? And do you agree with our preliminary recommendation? Or would you change it or tweak it? So for height, for example, uh, our ultimate preliminary recommendation for height is not to set a height limit across the entire city. Frankly, 
For practical reasons, that's a massive undertaking that will probably require your next official plan amendment with extensive consultation on a community-by-community -community basis. It also, as we noted in the report, has its strengths and weaknesses, its pros and cons relative to the messages it sends to the marketplace around how much land is worth. So ultimately, we recommended in a preliminary way that we don't set maximum heights throughout the city, but we do set them in the CBD because with all of the issues and challenges associated with uh, development in the Central Business District, uh, particularly in the heritage context of that, it felt necessary that there we needed to provide clarity so that everyone could understand what height is acceptable and what isn't, and frankly, we would take out the subjectivity and the ability to propose additional heights that exist in the current plan. It wouldn't be a one-size-fits-all approach to the height in the CBD. We would identify uh, sub-areas of the CBD that would have possibly different height maximums, but we would uh, do it uh, uh, with an established height maximum. Someone actually suggested through our engagement today that we should probably also set height minimums because in some contexts we want to make sure we don't get just one-story buildings in the CBD, which is a new thought we hadn't thought of. The second issue we, we considered, and, and normally we would probably start with this because it was actually the first question we got asked in almost every conversation we had, what do you consider a tall building? What is a mid-rise building? What is a tall building? We thought about options, looking at the third option, for a kind of flexible approach to that, a contextual approach, something that is tall in one context might not seem tall in another. But frankly, when we started to really play that out in terms of operationalizing it, it became very confusing, potentially, and complex. So we ultimately are recommending the simple approach. Option two, which is that mid-rises are four to six stories, Low rise is one to three stories, and tall buildings are anything above seven stories. That doesn't mean we would treat all buildings of seven stories and above the same relative to their context, but for simplicity of language, we're calling everything seven stories and above as a tall building. When we're thinking about all the different approaches to design policy for these 16 uh, design elements, the question is, do we set rules and expectations for the entire city as a whole, a one-size-fits-all approach, or do we recognize that there are different parts of the CBD, different parts of the city that have different natures, and thus we probably would be at least tweaking our design approach to tall and mid-rise buildings in those different contexts. We, so we considered options. Do you do it one size fits all across the city? Do you just do the CBD and everything outside the CBD? Ultimately, what we recommended was six, uh, at this stage, we're thinking about six um, areas that would be defined. This is the map on the back of the report committee. Uh, that would essentially allow us to adjust and tweak our approaches to tower width, setback, etc., slightly. These are not radical differences, but slightly relative to uh, differences in context. I do want to say, Council, that there has probably been nothing more confusing to members of the public and stakeholders this past week for the Chief Planner and I than this map. Because I think because we used it a base of the land use plan as a base for defining these areas. Most people who have looked at this think it's a land use plan that will tell them how tall their building can be uh, or how uh, dense it can be. That's not the intent of this map. The intent of this map was simply to define sub areas for how we might tweak our approach to design, like step backs, et cetera. I think once we've explained that, it, it has actually made the conversation e much easier and, and less uh, frustrating. But before that, uh, there was confusion, and we apologize for that. In hindsight, we should have done this map very differently. And these are, these are the various areas that uh, were, in the, were in the drawing here. Uh, next to height, probably building width has been the most uh, complex and potentially controversial element of building design. Uh, we've talked a lot over the course of the la last year plus about the nature of buildings being very large, not just because of their height, but because of their thickness, their width. When they get very large, the term that is often applied is a slab building, a building that's uh, very long and thick and has a very large uh, uh, visual profile with implications for urban design. Uh, the recommendations that we looked at in terms of uh, tower size in terms of thickness are to continue to do it by a case-by-case -case basis. Think about various approaches to maximum size. And ultimately, <coughs> excuse me, our, our recommendation was indeed to establish a maximum size 
In various applications we've been negotiating over the course of the last year, we've had a chance to try out various sizes uh, uh, in terms of design performance and, perform and uh, viability. And what we're recommending is that we would apply a maximum tower thickness or tall building thickness of approximately uh, um, 7,500 square feet or about uh, 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 700 meters for the most sensitive areas, the waterfront uh, and the heritage portions of the downtown if tall buildings are allowed in the, in the downtown. And that, of course, in the heritage portions, which would be determined by the, the height discussion that we would have. So that's only an if. Um, in the rest of the urban parts of the city, the, the, the north block portion of the downtown and the other urbanizing areas uh, in the green light uh, zone, we would be talking about about 800 square meters or 8,500 square feet, which is normal practice in terms of tower uh, uh, thickness that's being applied in many municipalities Ontario, in Ontario, including municipalities of similar size and scale to Kingston. The big question is how do we feel about much larger floor plates in the suburbs? Because one school of thought is that uh, the whole city should have a slimmer profile approach to tall buildings. Another school of thought is for reasons of affordability, simplicity, uh, energy performance, uh, should we continue to allow very large floor plate buildings in the suburbs because the urban design sensitiv sensitivities are different? Uh, we haven't taken an official position on that. We have heard pros and cons to that approach all week. One of the, the, the cons to it is actually that it might make density, it will make density easier in the suburbs than it is in the inner city portions, which is contrary to what we're trying to achieve through the green light strategy. So it would continue the kind of idea that it's actually easier to put density in the car dependent places than in the in less car dependent places, and we're wrestling with that. But we haven't taken a firm position, we don't have a recommendation yet, we're hearing from all parties on that. But that's probably from a tower width perspective, the biggest question uh, we're discussing. Council, as, as the chief planner noted, uh, we've integrated the question of the Williamsville uh, Main Street study or Main Street area into this work program. And the question is, what do we do about the, 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 the challenges that led to the interim control bylaw? And these are both uh, what the height question or what the height situation is and also the issue of what's called angular plane or angle of daylight. As council, I think, understands that the, the problem statement has been that uh, the definition of landmark building has allowed many 10-story, up to 10-story buildings become the pre predominant scale along the corridor. And as we've heard from many, many people, including staff and council in the community, that was never the intent. The landmark buildings were supposed to be rare buildings, if you will. The prevailing scale was supposed to be four to six stories. But because of the ability to do a landmark building if you assembled enough land, developers were assembling land and coming in with landmark buildings. I, I would characterize it as a loophole in terms of what was originally anticipated and intended in the policy. Uh, and thus, you've had uh, challenging situations about whether or not you apply angle of daylight and other things. It's led to a lot of problems. Uh, our recommendation uh, at this stage uh, is that essentially we would be saying no more landmark buildings using that definition. We would replace the locational, uh, the land area criteria with basically a new schedule that says, here are the remaining landmark sites. They are in these locations. They can't be as block long and large as the previous um, applications have been. They have to be a more tower profile to mark key intersections. Still only 10 stories, not taller than that. Uh, and angle of daylight wouldn't apply or angular plane because it doesn't have to. In tall, slimmer buildings, the shadow moves quickly, unlike the long, block-long buildings where you have to address shadow through an, a, a stepping down the angle of daylight provision. So we don't need angle of daylight anymore because it would be a fundamentally different building form where angle of daylight, frankly, doesn't work. So that is our proposed recommendation to address uh, the issue that hopefully would lead to an ability to move away from the interim control bylaw. Uh, Upper floor building step backs, these are the stepping back of the taller portions of the building at certain heights. It applies to mid-rise buildings, usually in the context of conversations about the fifth and sixth floor of a six-story building being stepped back. In the case of taller perimeter block buildings, it can be the seventh, eighth, or ninth story stepping back, as you have currently in your rules in, in portions of the CBD, for example. 
Are these a good idea? from an urban design perspective, from an affordability perspective, from an energy efficiency perspective, from a development viability perspective. We've run through it from a number of different scenarios. And forgive me, Mr. Chair, but this, this recommendation is a bit complex. Uh, for the mid-rise buildings, what we're saying as a sort of a soft recommendation at this point is that we're thinking for four to six story wood frame buildings, we would not require step backs. We want wood frame buildings to happen. Frankly, wood frame buildings have more challenges associated with this kind of angle step backs than concrete buildings do. And frankly, we'd like to see more wood frame for various reasons of sustainability, affordability, et cetera. So we're thinking we don't want to establish uh, design criteria that limits the, the likelihood and viability of this building form actually happening because of its sustainable advantage uh, for the city. Uh, we want to test that, though, through the economic analysis that Ms. Agnew talked about. So that's why I'm calling it a soft recommendation at this point. We want to analyze the situation a little more and understand the implications of those step backs from a viability perspective of projects. For seven to nine story buildings, which relate to some other portions of the city, but particularly in the North Block, for example, in the CBD, the question is, is a seven to nine story building has been called for for many years in, in that portion of the downtown, is it viable? Is it still viable if you have step backs? And there's various ways you can do step backs from the seventh to ninth floor. And is it still viable if you do both of those things and it's also a rental project? That's something we need to look at because we want to understand why market projects have not happened. Uh, with that when those rules are put in place. Non-market project, a, a non-profit project has happened, but not market projects. The economic analysis that Ms. Agnew talked about will educate us on that. But at this point, we have soft recommendations, but we are not prepared enough to say what we, that we know what we would recommend at this point because the economic analysis isn't complete. Uh, down at grade uh, council, it's the setback from the street, uh, from the right of way, that essentially gives you your public realm. The quality of that sidewalk experience, the width of it for pedestrian movement, for patios, for street furniture, all the things that make street life interesting. So if you go too far back, you separate your relationship from the street. If you go too close, as we've seen some examples of in the city, everything gets pinched. There's no room for patios and even pedestrians feel tight. So what is the, should we have a, 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 a minimum and a maximum setback to establish that ideal relationship? Our recommendation is that we do that. We haven't uh, decided what exactly that would be or how it would vary by those different context areas. But we think, frankly, it needs to be set and followed rig rigorously because it's not something we want to negotiate on a case-by-case -case basis with applications. If you have two towers relatively close together, how far away should they be? Tower separation has become maybe one of the easier uh, elements of design thinking to answer because almost every city we've looked at has established the same requirement. 25 meters or 80 feet is what's generally considered reasonable for towers like that to have sunlight access, neighborliness between towers, uh, views, et cetera, and even uh, disrupting any wind tunnel effects and such. So our recommendation would be that. Down at the ground floor, I, I, I'm saying this late in the list, but this is one of the most important elements of building design. How do you make sure that, to start, you don't have boring blank walls that make pedestrian activity not particularly interesting or attractive? How do you make sure if it's commercial operations that you have high levels of transparency and the ability for permeability between the inside and the outside of the building to make the sidewalk work really in a lively way? If it's residential uses at grade, how do you make sure those are successful, successful by changing grades slightly so that people aren't looking right into people's windows and they close their blinds and you get an essential blank wall? There are, there are good principles and learnings from many, many places that have told us what to do and not to do. We just don't want to negotiate them on a case-by-case -case basis so the policy would establish the expectation. This is one of the issues that I'm almost embarrassed to say we hadn't put in the original list, and it was members of the public who said, well, what about parking? And indeed, that is one of the biggest design challenges because if the parking isn't surface parking, and if it isn't underground, it's ending up inside the building itself. That we call that above grade parking. And it takes up a lot of the built form, plus you can see it. Uh, and so it has a lot of visual implications to the quality of the building. So what do you do about that? Uh, we looked at it in various contexts. 
And we have a series of sort of cascading recommendations, Council. First of all, our observation is it's very hard to design a good building if there is too much parking. And we're actually suggesting that in the context of other work programs, the city take a good look at trying to achieve less parking. Not, not breaking uh, the, the laws of, of, of physics and the market these days in terms of current car ownership, but moving the dial on that so that although people will still have cars in the city for a while, you want that to be trending down in terms of car ownership over time and given the climate emergency, maybe over faster periods of time. So we're recommending that the city reconsider the parking minimums moving forward in other work programs and probably create a maximum parking requirement because we're running into that in the negotiations with individual projects. Where there is still parking obviously needed, we're saying if it can go underground, it should. Now, to be clear, there's lots of places where it can't go viably underground in Kingston, but where it can, uh, as much of it that is reasonable and feasible should go underground. But for the parking that would go above grade, we've got two recommendations. In the CBD, we're essentially, and the urban areas, we're suggesting that you should put the parking inside the building. Uh, separate it uh, physically from the edge of the building that people can see by intervening uses like office space or residential units or what have you. So it's functionally invisible. That's a high standard and that would be the standard we would apply to the most urban places that we care about the most, the downtown, the urban places. In the less urban places we're saying it doesn't need to be inboard into the middle of the building but it does need to be screened. Uh, so it's maybe still apparent, but it's not as obvious. And you can often combine that with public art or other creative ways to screen that experience. It's a lower standard uh, for, for places that aren't quite as visually sensitive. Uh, just very quickly, Council, we did consider, uh, again because of a recommendation from members of the public, uh, about looking at opportunities to facilitate more active transport supports, like bike parking and other, uh, other things like that. Uh, Ultimately, all we decided to do in this work program is create supportive policy uh, for other work programs because, frankly, that is being addressed through active transport policy work through the Transportation Department as we speak. And at this point, we don't want to duplicate that effort, just support it through supporting policies. Council, as I said, this was merciful. I think we had about eight or nine more, and we spared you those. But there are 16 in the report, and we're actually asking the public for input through a very detailed uh, 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 form to give us their comments on if they think we're on the right track of each one, plus the big issues like the where and where not of density, the green light strategy, et cetera. I'll end with a couple of quick slides just from my perspective, uh, because you've heard from your chief planner, my perspective as, as your advisor, on how this work relates to, I think, other work that's being done in other places, to give you a, a bit of a sense of a context of that. First of all, and some of these are gonna sound a bit uh, complimentary, and that's on purpose, because I'm actually, in many cases, complimenting this work. There's many ways that this work is cutting edge in terms of where I see this work, how I see this work normally being done in, elsewhere in the province, and beyond, which puts Kingston, I think, in a creative place in terms of being ahead of the game on some of these things. First of all, in most city halls, the last thing a city hall work team wants to do is change the work scope, the scope of work. We actually have a pejorative term for it. It's called scope creep. We want to avoid scope creep because we want to get the project done. We've done the opposite in this case. As new observations like the, the urgent need to address the where and where not of density have come up, the obvious opportunity that we, we're having a very hard time addressing tall buildings without addressing mid-rise at the same time, obviously the interim control bylaw in Williamsville and the challenges in the North Block, we've inboarded that work into this. It's added a little bit of time to our exercise, but frankly, it's making the, the results and, and the interconnectedness of the work just much better. And I give staff and, and the city manager credit for that because most cities avoid doing that like the plague and it is totally the smart thing to have done in this case and it's led to much better outcomes. Oh, sorry. Uh, you council asked us to be as transparent as we could be. You'll note that the document, it still isn't necessarily easy reading because this is complex stuff, but we've tried to make it as transparent as possible by, as I said, showing all our work. So we're hoping that this helps educate the conversation, and that's been really one of our emphasis. The downside is it's 42 pages, committee, but I think hopefully it's, it, it does a good job of facilitating and educating the conversation. It's the first exercise of this type, building design for tall and mid-rise buildings that I've seen that has made the direct 
connection to the climate emergency. So it is including considerations that I have never seen tall and mid-rise building design guidelines or policies address. And so you're, you're breaking new ground in that sense. And deliberately connecting the work to the economic realities through the economic analysis, that is a first for Kingston. And I'm sad to say it's very rare for any city hall. So you're, you're doing something that uh, should be done all the time, but unfortunately isn't done enough. And at the same time, connecting it to the, in, uh, the energy efficiency issues, uh, which again is a new lens to look at this work that I haven't seen previous work in other cities do. So all of that is, is to complement the city on embracing the complexity of this exercise. We're also looking at forward-looking approaches like the green light strategy that the chief planner explained, but also looking forward to the next technology of wood construction, not wood frame, but mass timber, CLT, and making sure, because we know that, that it's already allowed in British Columbia, it's probably going to be allowed up to 12 stories in the National Building Code next year. And why would we want to write an approach that basically is obsolete for the next technology that's coming in a few years and hopefully will be commonplace relatively soon, although it always takes time for the industry to, to, to move into new areas. So we have looked at all this through the lens of what we know about mass timber or CLT and what works in that technology and what doesn't work in that technology. And that's really educated our thinking around things like building step backs, for example, which are problematic with that technology. Lastly, Council, I'll say, uh, I'll say that uh, Notwithstanding what I've said about us breaking new ground, most of the design approaches we're talking here are not best practice. They are not cutting edge or bleeding edge. And that's actually a deliberate decision because we didn't want to push the industry to a place where, frankly, it's further than you need to go just because we wanted to say we were best practice. Most of the things I've showed you in terms of the actual details of building design are normal practice. They become normal practice across the province. So we know from similar cities in your backyard of the province that they, they can work. But we want to educate ourselves further through the economic analysis. Lastly, I'll say, as, as the chief planner said, uh, and I tend to be a blunt person who always says to my political clients, this will be hard. Many of these things we're talking about are different. They are change. Uh, they, are, they, they would substantially affect business as usual. But if you're serious about things like connecting the dots between land use decisions and design decisions and your climate emergency and your other challenges like public health and infrastructure costs, et cetera, this is what it takes. Something like this is what it takes to really address those urgent goals. Thank you. So in terms of next steps, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, this period is open for about six weeks. We had looked at having December 31st or the end of December, early January being the end of our commenting period related to the issues and options report. So again, lots of opportunity for further conversation. We do have events going into next week and we'll continue to take meetings with individual groups if they're interested, take written correspondence. Uh, we're also thinking about some additional public activities that we can undertake related to this work between now and the end of 2019. The intention of, of the feedback is to again evaluate that against the recommendations that we're making tonight and then again be very instrumental in informing the policy work that we're going to start writing in 2020. The time frame associated with presenting recommendations to council associated with this work is the end of May 2020. So we need to start writing policy fairly early in the new year and we'll have a period of consultation on the draft policy prior to bringing anything forward to council for consideration late in May. We do have a get, a get Involved platform. A lot of people have been activating and using that. Uh, Andrea Gummo is here. She is our project manager. She's connected with a number of you and will continue to be available. We're happy to take questions on any of the information that we presented tonight and look forward to hearing public comments. Thank you. Um, I will now uh, give the uh, committee an opportunity to ask questions or to make comments. This is an information report only. Um, we don't always allow questions from the public for information reports, but in this case, we will be doing so. Uh, so uh, after the committee has had an opportunity to, to pose questions or make comments, we'll give the public an opportunity to do likewise. 
So it's now open to the committee. Are the, yes, Councillor Chappelle. So I noticed uh, a lot of the presentation on the Council's Climate Emergency Declaration. Um, I, I just happened to be reading some interesting posts um, about communities in California that are actually encouraging development it to no longer permit natural gas expansion so all sites would be electrified. Is that something you've looked at as well, that any new builds would be uh, electrified instead of natural gas use? Thanking through you, we haven't advanced our thinking to that level of detail at this time. Certainly, um, we're looking at green building technologies as part of uh, the design considerations, but we haven't advanced that stage of really looking at how buildings are going to be powered, but that's something we can take into consideration. If you haven't thought of it, don't worry about it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, next question or comment? Thank you, Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through your presentation. You mentioned that there would be a number of sub areas within the city, I think you said up to six, but then within those areas, you also mentioned that there could be sub sub areas. Could you talk about some of the considerations to define those features? And the reason for my question is, I think it's important to recognize the difference in neighborhoods in different contexts within the city. My caution or red flag in hearing that would be that we don't have so many that it's no longer discernible about why a different area has a different standard. That's a great question. So what we have suggested, and it's reflected in this, looking at the subcontext. Again, this is high level and this is for preliminary discussion. We've looked at six. Uh, definitely, we don't want to get to a point where we're going on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis because that would give us 52 subcontexts in the urban area, which probably would be pretty unmanageable. Um, some of the things that we're looking at specifically, we've looked at some of the heritage overlays that are in the official plan, uh, certainly as part of some of the discussions that came up this week and, and hasn't been factored in to the level of mapping we've done at this place at this point in time or if there's neighborhoods for example that have a heritage conservation district that applies to it so those <laughs> types of things we'd be looking at as well uh, there are differences um, within even elements of princess street if you think about that so the character of williamsville versus what it looks like maybe at the, the hub portion of princess and lower princess so we are trying to look at what some of the physical differences are without getting to a point where we're you know over regulating or, or reducing it to, to so many subcontexts that it becomes unmanageable. Yes, any further questions? I see Councillor Hutchison, I believe, wants to comment. Um, just for a matter of clarity, the, um, you indicated you're, you had a definition of tall buildings being seven plus stories. That's correct. And um, so what factors would allow more than seven stories? particularly in the, in the central business district? That's a great question, and I think that's something that um, is going to be decided based on collaboration with the community, not something that we'd be deciding in isolation. Uh, there's a variety of things to look at, specifically they're context-related, I think. Um, so it also is going to be depending on some of the economic analysis that we're doing. Again, making sure that the policy we're writing, we want to make sure that what we're what we're writing actually gets built. The city needs housing. We have underutilized parcels. We have underutilized infrastructure in terms of um, investments in in-ground piping, transit infrastructure. We've had a lot of good wins with respect to our transit ridership. But as we want, if we want to go to the next level, we have to look at how we densify and move people differently. So there's all different types of considerations. Context, of course, is important as well too in terms of what's the prevailing scale and built form in the area. Is there environmental contamination present? Does that need to be factored into our decision making? Looking at the viability of policy. Um, on construction, do you have any information about where the province is on this, since it usually takes a considerable amount of time? Thank you, through you. As I understand it, there uh, have been discussions with respect to the National Building Code replacing Provincial Building Code. That's been going on for a period of time. Certainly this provincial government is looking at it and they're looking at different ways to deregulate the building industry based on some of the recommendations that have come forward. I don't know specifically what's going to happen with respect to that, but there have been suggestions um, even by as early as 2020. I don't know if it will happen with the National Building Code potentially replacing individual provincial building codes. There are 
greater permissions in the National Building Code right now with respect to wood frame construction. BC is leading the way with respect to that. They do have 12-story wood frame buildings that are basically being tested in that province, and whether or not that ends up rolling out across the country is uncertain at this time, but we are expecting within the next couple of years some changes to come down the pipeline based on the information we've been provided to date. Which code, the national or the provincial, has precedence? Pardon me? Which code, the provincial or the national building code, has precedence in Ontario? In the province of Ontario, we're by the Ontario building code. So if the national code changes, it necessarily change the landscape? Not necessarily, um, but what is discussed federally is that dual provinces would no longer have their own codes, but to move to a more unified national code, that's part of the conversation. Uh, that's accurate, but I would also add that tradition or experience has suggested that usually one province uh, uh, shows innovation, it goes to the national code. As soon as it goes to the national code, the, the other provincial codes follow along. So it, they can sometimes have some lag, but it, uh, in everything I can think of, it's happened that way. Thank you. Thank you to you. So my understanding work is completed. This would be, would be implemented sort of in advance of any comprehensive zoning bylaw that we ultimately come up with, or or, or, the, or in advance of the of the review of the official plan uh, and the sort of changes to it that would be maybe be coming within the next five years or so. Is that correct? Yes, through you, th that is correct. The intention is to bring official plan amendments through this work. That would be in May of 2020. Our next comprehensive review of the official plan isn't due until 2023. So work, pre-work will begin on that in 2022. The city's comprehensive zoning bylaw, we're just finalizing the second draft of that and that will be out for consultation in, uh, in 2020 as well. So there will be pieces that are moving along simultaneously. Any further questions? Seeing none, could could the vice chair? I take the. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to hear the, the official plan and the comprehensive zoning plan. We've gone through several official plan amendments, but we continue to have zone zoning bylaws that are 20 and 30 years old. And with all due respect for developers and planners in the room, that usually means that a certain amount of cherry picking takes place. We're told this fits the zoning, so we'd like to do this, but this fits the official plan, so we would like you to allow us to do this. So we desperately need a comprehensive zoning bylaw. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I wanna thank you for the work and the focus you've done on the Williamsville corridor. Um, the, for people who wonder, uh, interim control bylaws are very, very seldom done. Uh, and in my 15 years as a counselor, there's only been one other occasion in the 90s that I remember us ever doing an interim control bylaw. The main problem that people were concerned about in Williamsville was across the street, a fairly narrow street, Prince, Upper Princess Street, there was the distinct possibility that you would have two 10-story buildings facing one another and, you, and suddenly we'd be creating uh, what's called a canyoning effect or a wind tunnel kind of thing. So uh, would your proposal uh, eliminate that potential from happening along Princess. Thank you and through you. So we did do the review of the work specifically with that being one of the concerns that was identified through the interim control bylaw discussion. The intention of having a locational schedule that would identify locations where 
the additional tall buildings can go or 10 story building maximum within the Williamsville corridor is to specifically address that. So we can ensure that there's proper separation of taller elements of buildings and that there, there is space um, to prevent that canyoning effect. So that is the intention of, of the schedule and also identifying what we mean by landmark. The document right now refers to landmark. There's no definition associated with it. And I think it was quite unintentional when the implementing zone, zoning was written for the Williamsville Main Street study. It didn't anticipate any land assembly. So it thought that the, the, the uh, that the area would build out more on a lot by lot basis. And what happened in terms of the market and interpreting the policy, it identified that if you bought several parcels of land and consolidated them into one, you'd be able to get the lot depth that's needed to be able to consider a taller landmark building. And what we're trying to do is, is make sure that we're being really specific about undoing those pieces that are there and replacing them with tools that are much better at regulating the form. Thank you. So it would be accurate to say uh, that anybody who purchased property along the corridor have four to six stories by right, and any additional upzoning is contingent on, uh, on negotiation for the development with the city. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's correct. The uh, the C four H zone is what applies to the Williamsville corridor. What it does allow, as of right currently, is four to six stories um, in some certain locations. Um, there isn't, as of right, ten story zoning anywhere. So that's why you've seen individual site specific applications for the ten story buildings that have come through. So as part of moving forward, when these amendments are made individual applications, if they're looking for 10 stories and they're in the location that's identified on the new schedule, they would be applied against all of the design standards that we're suggesting through this policy work. And just to clarify for some members of the community, there are, I believe, a couple of approved and a couple proposed that are working now in process under the previous zoning. Uh, conditions uh, so so those will be handled accordingly but uh, future applications this will apply uh, the, the if if council adopts this that will apply for those future ones is that accurate that's correct. This policy won't retroactively remove any entitlements that have been established through independent application. So those projects that have been approved by council will be able to proceed to construction. There's one application that was filed prior to the passing of the interim control bylaw that will be processed under the existing policies that were in effect at the time the interim control bylaw was filed with respect to the official plan in, in particular. But anything net new after the interim control bylaw is lifted, subject to these policy amendments being supported by council and implemented without any type of appeal, would be measured against those policies. Thank you. Um, the other comment I just want to make really quickly is the previous 10 stories have all come in at full lot coverage, and the main complaint I've heard from the community is how uh, the lack of, of uh, setback has pinched uh, the pedestrian way. Uh, and virtually everybody has done payment in lieu of parklands. So part of the plan was to allow for some green space mm -hmm. along the corridor. Uh, would, would this policy, if adopted, achieve those uh, those goals that were set forth in the uh, in in the corridor plan in the secondary plan that came forward. Thank you, and through you. So certainly, we are talking about um, appropriate setbacks from property. Again, looking at making sure that there's an appropriate public realm to achieve all the things that we want to achieve within the public realm, whether it's green space, whether it's street furniture, whether it's street trees in particular. As part of the development of the locational schedule, we will also be going back to look at the 
the high level strategy that was put in place, although it was never implemented as a schedule with respect to urban parkettes. So we'll be looking at those proposed locations um, as a consideration of identifying any additional sites that um, potentially could take a 10 story building at a key intersection. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, oh, Councillor Hill. Thank you. Just so, and I might have this wrong, but mine, the, uh, uh, the official plan has to be approved by the province. Uh, but this uh, work that you're doing, which I really can congratulate you on because I, I think I and I'm sure everybody in this room is, is looking forward to the kind of clarity that it's going to bring to this process. Right? But uh, would this also be approved by the province, this particular component? And if, and if, uh, and I guess ultimately, what will its standing be in front of a, of a tribunal ultimately? Like does it have the kind of influence uh, or the standing, I guess, that the official plan would have uh, when we're reviewing projects that are under appeal? So the intention of this work is to result in amendments that will be implemented into our official plan. Council is the decision-making body. These are um, smaller amendments compared to a comprehensive review, which is what we just went through with respect to OPA 50, and that's really when the province starts to get involved because it's a comprehensive plan review. Uh, there are appeal rights, of course, associated with any type of amendment um, for official plan under the Planning Act, the same thing with zoning bylaws. So subject to council feeling confident that they can approve them, if we get through the appeal period with no appeals, the amendments are in effect and then they're representative of key policies or official plan that any development application would get reviewed against in the, in the future and would have significant stature before uh, the Ontario Municipal Board or the LPAT. Thank you. Any further questions? Yes, Councillor Osanek and then Councillor Powell. Thank you, Mr. Yu. Just looking at this map, I just wondered, I just wanted to ask some questions about the pink large site urbanizing places. So you have like the Cat Mall area on there right now, so, and also Kingston Center area as, as pink. So is that assuming if it's no longer a plaza, like a shopping mall one day, that's where we could do big development work? Because I see you have like the tannery lands on there too as pink, and also the Elkan property. So that's assuming that Kingston Center and the Cat Mall area one day might be up for development? Uh, so again, just to, to rate, this map isn't about allocating density or height, it's talking about subcontext. When it, so when it looks at those parcels, it's really determining what type of policy is going to apply to it in terms of the different options that we've considered, how the buildings have to be oriented. That said, definitely again, when we look at the green light strategy, these are urban areas that are fully serviced but have underutilized parcels of land associated with them. So we have started to look at them as possibilities to, um, to take some additional height and density only at a very high level. Certainly any type of advancement of those concepts really needs to involve the property owners themselves, but given where they are with respect to transit, walkability, other amenities that are there, they are from a locational perspective um, places that could, look, could be looked at in terms of um, additional density beyond what's there now. Thank you, and just to follow up to that end of this process, will we be getting another map like this that will show like in more detail, this is where we could be like for mid-rise and this is where it would be, you know, for 10 plus stories? Through you, Mr. Chief, for the question because it gives us a chance again to clarify what this map isn't. This map is not um, a land use plan that establishes density, height, etc. cetera. Um, that kind of exercise would probably be in the context of a similar um, kind of exercise to the tannery site, which you're very familiar with. Um, or it could be the context of a special policy area or something like that. But it won't be designed in terms of its height, et cetera, through this exercise because it's in this color. So the, the best way I can explain it, or try to explain it again, Council, is the purpose of these areas is to de determine if there's different approaches to building design in different areas. The only reason those kinds of sites are shown in a different color than what we've called street-oriented urbanizing places is because they are large enough that they will have, we anticipate, their own streets. 
like the tannery site, for example. And the question is, would we expect that the buildings would orient or have relationships with those newly created streets or drive aisles that kind of feel like a street different than what we would expect of a project that fronts onto an existing street right now? I'm actually not sure if we would have a different approach. But given there's the possibility we might, we put them into a preliminary into a separate category. At the end of the day, when we actually look at how we would apply the rules, if they're basically the same thing, those two would get merged into one category. But right now we wanted to remind ourselves moving forward that we might treat things differently when the site is large enough to have its own road network or street network rather than frontage onto an existing street. And just a quick comment. Uh, people have pointed out that some of the map covers parks and I just wanna assure everybody that there is no plan to develop, put developments on parks. That it's just that there's a broad mapping approach for areas. So is that accurate? That's correct. Thank you. So any further comments from oh, Councillor Chappelle? Yes, you by creating this map. Um, have we not inadvertently created a situation where land acquisition can occur and because the property value would really be in the permitted density of zones. So we basically are creating a market here of property that's more valuable than others. Is, is, is that not a risk at play here? To you, Mr. Chair, only if uh, potential purchasers and developers misinterpret what this map is which is why we're trying to clarify it so quickly. And ironically, if they made business decisions based on that, they, they probably would have moved too fast. That's why we're trying to make sure everybody understands what this does. It does not grant in any way different land use approvals than in your existing official plan. What it actually does is establish the design expectations that would be required. So assuming it would, and nowhere in this document, just to be clear, I regret the way the base that was used for this map, but there's nothing in the text of this document that suggests in any way that this document does what some have interpreted. The problem has just been that they've just looked at it without going to the page that it specifically references and reading what it actually means. Great, thank you. Seeing no further questions from the committee, I'll now open it up uh, to the public. Uh, there's a speak, uh, and I will read the names out. There's a, a microphone here, and you can grab any microphone available on this side. Everybody has five minutes. Uh, I would strongly suggest that you give that you you need to give your name and your address. Uh, and so we will begin with. Megan Knott. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Megan Knott. I'm Executive Director of uh, Tourism Kingston as well as Kingston Accommodation Partners. And I know I've been here a few times to talk to you about specific items. Uh, today, no different. So um, I, did, I just wanted to speak to the fact that uh, when dealing with our current board and our current committees and reading uh, the Density by Design report, we did identify many parallels as it relates to the integrated destination strategy. So the IDS strategy, as you know, I came to council and council endorsed that last year in terms of giving solid recommendations for the future of tourism and how we forward those particular priorities. And so a lot of these priorities uh, blend very well with uh, the ones that are in the recommendation that we're talking about tonight. So I just wanted to speak in support of that as well as the fact that, as we know, uh, tourism is a key economic driver within the city. Uh, in 2018 specifically, $550 million was accrued uh, as tourism spend in our city. Uh, year to date today with our research strategy, uh, all encompassing, uh, we're at 479 million. So tourism is a very important, uh, I think, entity and fabric of our community. And how that relates to what the uh, topic of tonight is, is that vibrant, prosperous downtowns in Kingston are really vital, vital for our tourism economy. 
And more and more, our tourists, as we know through research, uh, look to seek authentic experiences. And that's that they come into our community and they don't have a specific plan. They really just want to walk and enjoy what Kingstonians enjoy. That they don't come for a specific plan. They just want to experience our coffee shops. They want to experience our retail. They want to experience our restaurants. But they want to do that in a very dense and safe environment so that they're not um, spread about uh, in terms of the travel distance and time. Uh, that it takes them to do these experiences, that they interact uh, and live like locals live. And so, um, you know, too, in our research, we know that economic development uh, dovetails nicely in with tourism in the fact that uh, a good place to visit is a good place to live. And so we're always looking to make sure that tourists live that sort of authentic, true experience in Kingston so that potentially uh, in future they would come and be a resident of Kingston uh, and work in our economy and enjoy the things that we do as Kingstonians. Through our research, we also know um, specifically the surveys that we're deploying across the city that retail, restaurants, uh, galleries, sightseeing, attractions, uh, and others are kind of the real points of consideration when tourists come into uh, Kingston. And so that these types of experiences have to be close together. And uh, intensification really does that. It does provide uh, support that we need, not only for offering these types of uh, services, but also that in times where tourism isn't peak within our city, that residents can support these types of experiences so that uh, people that uh, offer these types of restaurants or retail, they see customers coming through the door in non-peak times, such as you know February, March. We know we identify that we need more winter product, but in lieu of that, that there's people that support these types of economic uh, generating points that we need uh, to then offer to tourism uh, people, tourists all year round. Ecotourism, as we know, climate emergency here in the city, um, tourists are savvy and they know that the less economic, uh, the less eco footprint that they have, uh, the green traveler, as you will, it's important to them. And so they want to come into the city, they want to come in as eco-friendly as possible, and then they want to experience our city as eco-friendly as possible. And so being able to do that in a safe, pedestrian-friendly kind of defense, <laughs> what am I trying to say? Um, safe spot is essentially, um, you know, part of our uh, unique selling proposition. So that uh, you know, tourists don't want to displace and travel once they've traveled here. They want to travel by foot. Oh, 30 seconds. Um, and that our um, our brand really is, as we've presented many times at council, old versus new. And so that. We do have an architecture within the city that's unique. That's why people come and visit. That's why they take pictures. That's why they enjoy it. And so our brand is old versus new. And there really is a tourist ad, uh, there really are tourists that admire what we do within our city to blend the old and new. And I think there's probably a position that tourism uh, says that stakes the claim that we do that well. And we can probably continue to do that well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next. Uh person is Doug Ritchie from the BIA. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, all those present, Doug Ritchie, um, admire the work being done by the team on the density by design. Uh, <clears throat> reading Reading the document, um, a very important paragraph struck me uh, in the section on density in the right locations, offering two possible scenarios where densification anywhere is one, and densification in the right places is, is the second. The paragraph says, when tall buildings and associated high density are placed in well-connected, mixed-use locations, well-serviced by attractive, frequent, and well-connected public transit service and walking and biking infrastructure, in addition to the general benefits of density discussed in the previous scenario, which was the density anywhere, other significant public benefits are achieved and problems are avoided. Car dependency is lessened with mode shift from driving to public transit, walking and biking, with resulting greenhouse gas uh, and climate change, public health infrastructure costs 
equity and economic development benefits. Market interest is not eroded by too much housing supply in problematic locations without a planned function. And it goes on, and, and in summary, what, what it means to me that to maximize the benefits to this community, both environmental, social, health and wellness, and economic, you've got to put density in full service commercial zones. There's got to be groceries. There's got to be retail. There's got to be personal services. You need to be able to walk to a supermarket, a specialty food store, your doctor, your dentist, um, all the professional services, all the personal services, your third place, your home, your work, and your special place, whether it's a coffee shop, your physio, your yoga salon, or your pub, have to be in walking distance from proximity to one another. If you can't enjoy a really pleasant, enjoyable walk of seven to nine minutes to buy your groceries, you get in your car. And in this town, that means in 15 minutes, you can be anywhere you want. It also has to be in the primary employment district. And in this city, that is <clears throat> along the waterfront, CFB Kingston, Fort Henry, RMC, downtown and the 600 businesses there, KGH, Queens, St. Lawrence College, in fact, a 2.5 kilometer uh, radius around the uh, intersection, which is the center of downtown, Bagot and Princess, results in over 35,000 jobs, so way more than 50% in the entire region. If you're not located there, you're just creating commutes from a larger, taller building. You're not cutting greenhouse gas emissions. It has to be in the major transportation hub. Public Transit Central is downtown Kingston, and biking and walking. And the walking is not just a distance, it's the nature of the walk. Um, a, a, a a 12-minute walk along Gardner's Road is just transporting yourself. It is not enjoyable. It is not something you can do pedestrian counts in different parts of the city. Um, and you won't, you won't find any that approach the Princess Street, uh, Bagot and Princess. So high walkability scores, uh, it's got to be fun. It's got to be surprising. Pleasant, interesting, a place that already has high pedestrian counts, really slow moving vehicle traffic. Princess Street is just dropping under 30K on average on, on a daily basis. Narrow streets, wide sock sidewalks, a huge number of intersections per acre, and cafe, cafes, boutiques, pubs, and patios. So. To maximize the benefits, full service commercial zones, primary employment district, transportation hub, and walkability. Thank you. Thank you very much. The person is Ken Dancer from Caracol. Ken Dancer, I'm the development manager for Carico Development Corporation. Uh, Carico is a family owned local Kingston company that builds almost exclusively inside the urban growth boundary. We build low, medium, and high rise buildings, so we're directly affected by many issues within the, uh, the report as you see it or the policy as you see it. Just like to uh, quote a few different parts of the report that I think are key and important to the impacts or implications of what's in the report. So uh, low vacancy rate driven by lack of supply. 
Um, that's a very short form of a very complicated thing that actually would require study for this report to speak to that issue. Um, there are many factors, including demographics, uh, types of occupancy, all kinds of things that I think require study. And in order for you to rely upon fixing something, you have to have proper information. Uh, further research is required. Um, it defaults to 600 and some units to get to 3% vacancy. There is pent up need, which is actually uh, in the document, and I think that requires further study. Uh, suburban high-rises, there's some comments about suburban high-rises uh, basically being discouraged or in some way guided. Um, they form a large portion of the public demand, the current public demand, and it's actually, um, uh, just to skip to the last point, that's referenced in the document. There's quite a bit of uh, the growth within the community and the suites that are started that are actually served by suburban high-rises. Uh, public demand actually includes a desire for a car, which is required by zoning. So that's um, uh, an issue that is compared in the document to being car-centered and not environmental, but it's actually part of market demand. So for variety, the public is going to ask for both. Suburban developments um, could not be transplanted and parked downtown and have the same yield. It's not possible. Tighter sites different restrictions, and of course this guiding document. So uh, if one were to preclude suburban high-rises, you would not see the same number of suites created in a downtown scenario. Uh, the average age and the demographics of these types of developments, if you were to pull the uh, different developers, you'd find that they're significantly higher than the average age of the community as a greater whole. Uh, there's two quotes in here about financial feasibility, and uh, there is a report that is in process, but uh, the assumptions that are made in this policy actually rely on these two quotes, um, that a mid-rise can be a change challenging feasibility, which is a correct statement. Um, design policies shouldn't add significantly or in unreasonably, const um, unreasonably construction costs and housing cost levels without demonstrably and justifiably public in in interest advantages. So there's guidance in the document that has advantages. There is cost implications to almost all of them. Um, so in order to guide you, you need to know the financial feasibility which you do not have in front of you. So I think it's very important that that feasibility study be received, reviewed by you, reviewed by stakeholders, and ensure that it's reliable and is guiding to things that are feasible as opposed to expensive. Uh, budgetary consideration, so it, it's just continuing on the same point. Budgetary considerations are deferred to forthcoming feasibility analysis. It's a little unclear what that analysis is being asked for and what's actually in it and what can be relied upon it for this overall. Um. <laughs> okay. Um. Uh, don't move too quickly basically is the ending statement there. Uh, you do have time within 2020 to make sure you're making smart choices and not uh, inadvertently causing development to not occur. You do want development to occur in a smart way. Building height. Uh, so two quotes there. Taller buildings can be more financially efficient or affordable, true statement. Um, and uh, th depending on height, some costs are fixed. Land, elevators, et cetera. It's a very true statement and is a, um, a basic factor of any development feasibility study. Uh, it's important to recommend that an economic analysis will be conducted in order to determine the permitted nine-story building approach is viable with or with their variables um, as step-back requir requirements above the sixth floor or angular plane requirements. So um, if in the previous statement, a couple pages ago, uh, some buildings are unfeasible, you don't want to develop a report that limits at that level because uh, if a project is not feasible at, for example, nine stories, then you, then you will not see development, which is not the impact that you want. Uh, lastly, location. 
um, if I can skip to the A and the B there, affordability and the need to create supply. From my perspective of what I've heard from council, there is a need to promote affordability, which I would call a variety of units. There's gonna be creation of luxury units, there needs to be a creation of affordable units as well. So you need variety and you need suites. You need, you need suite count as well as, uh, okay, thank you. Sweet count is kind of, affordability comes from sweet count. If you don't have sweets created, you're not gonna get affordability either. Okay, thank you very much. I, I'm open to questions if you need any. So, uh, next is David Truesdale from Homestead. Good evening. Thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak to you today about this. Um, we're happy at Homestead to, to see that the city of Kingston is looking at bringing forward policies to support multifamily development and bring some clarity to that. However, I want to talk to you today and address um, some potential concerns that we have with the options and issues discussion and some of the uh, conclusions that are drawn for it from it. First and foremost, um, we were dismayed to read in the report um, that uh, the city feels that this is a short-term housing crisis that we're in. Um, I think you, you hear this number, 645 units thrown around quite a bit to, to bring the city to a 3% vacancy rate. I, I'd like to make that clear. If you go into the Watson and Associates population and projection report that uh, was presented in March 2000 or May 2019, that assumes that demand stays constant. That is a, a, a one-time percentage calculation. And the issue is, is as, as Mr. Dancer talked about from Carico, demand has not remained constant. We know that. If you look at the population of Kingston, it is aging. Within that, obviously, we're getting more seniors. Seniors have a propensity for, for multifamily housing, so that's increasing. We've got student enrollment increasing at St. Lawrence College, at Queens, at, at very high rates. That was in that report. That's obviously driving demand as those groups look for multifamily housing. And also, Kingston is obviously a very reti a popular retirement destination. It's uh, number five in Ontario. It's in the top 10, or I think it's ninth in Canada uh, from desirability perspective. So that's bringing more seniors in our community, which again is driving demand. So. This, we need to make it clear, it's, it's not just a supply issue. Supply is a big part of it, but it's also demand has been increasing at a faster pace than in the past. So 645 units is misleading, and, and we're concerned that if policies are being created based on this 645 units solving the issue, I think we're gonna have a, a bit of a problem down the line. Specifically in regards to the, uh, the options and discussions paper, there are some things in there that we are concerned about in regards to the impact on affordability of multifamily housing. I'm happy to hear that obviously they're gonna be doing economic analysis, but some of the things that need to be kept in mind is if you're going to target specific areas and put zoning or, or imply that zoning can be allowed in those areas, you are gonna be driving up land cost and you're gonna be limiting supply of land. If you're going towards smaller floor plates, the unit yield obviously from a construction perspective is, is, is going to lessen. You're not gonna get as many units out of a building. Again, that will drive up cost. And furthermore, if you're gonna be doing extensive building setbacks or, or working towards uh, issues like that, again, your unit yield will suffer. So there has to be a, a, an understanding that as you drive up construction costs or make construction more affordable, Obviously, subsequently, it's gonna become more affordable for the end user as a yield needs to be obtained. As I mentioned earlier, I was happy to hear that economic modeling is gonna be done because I think it's very important that economic modeling drive the policies and procedures that are gonna come out of this very, very important study. It's, it's gonna have far-reaching implications. One of the things that I, I am concerned about, though, is, is obviously members of the public being development community, stakeholders, and, and just members of the general public we're only allowed until the end of December to provide comments, but if you look in the report, there's many things in here that, that rely and are influenced by the economic modeling. So in the sake of transparency and in the sake of being able to make informed comments, I think it is irresponsible to be asking for us to provide comments by the end of December if we're not gonna be able to see the economic modeling. 
If the economic model is going to be available at the beginning of January, I'd recommend giving at least till the end of January for, for members of the community and stakeholders to provide comments. The other thing that, that I would like to see is uh, obviously comparisons to other cities. Um, you know, in, in, in the report they talk about best practices, uh, you know, what other cities are doing. I think it's important to see that because um, at Homestead we do have experience in other cities. We build in Toronto, we build in Ottawa. And uh, I do know, uh, you know, in the report it talks about a best practice being 700 square meter floor plates. Both the city of Toronto, both the city of Ottawa use 750 square meter floor plates. Those are cities with a lot of experience in high rise development. So I think we need to be careful to ensure that we can see right across the, uh, the, the broad array of what other cities are doing. In, in conclusion, I th again, I think Studies like this are very important. I'm excited to see that economic modeling is being done to see what the feasibility of development is. Um, I think we just need to make sure that we're putting policies in place that are supporting multifamily housing because to go back to what I started with, we are in a housing crisis and the foreseeable future we are gonna to continue to be in this housing crisis as, as obviously demand for this type of housing increases. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nathan Richard from Patrick. Good evening, yes, uh, so my name's Nathan Richard. Uh, I'm a consultant with Patrick Development and uh, we do applaud the work that's gone into this. This is a very difficult document to, uh, to construct, I think from, from a consultant perspective. Um, uh, one of the things we do kind of think about is the, you know, where's the perspective line on, on buildings? Um, is, it, is it focused on the passerby, the people that are walking on the street that, that see a building for a few minutes, or is it, is it the people actually live in the buildings for you know, 8, 10, 12 hours per day, um, and kind of the square footage that they need to live in? Um, we do applaud the members of, of council uh, for promoting or I guess encouraging wood construction. We do recognize that as a, a, a positive for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it's a durable, affordable, renewable resource. Um, one of the projects that we looked at, that we're looking at right now, it's, it's, a, it's a large project and, and um, the numbers that we got from the Canadian Wood Council is that you could grow, the, grow those trees back in 60 seconds in Canada. So that, that gives you perspective on, on kind of what you're working with on renew, renewable resource side of things. Um, the other things that, and some of the work I think Brent had, had meant, touched on that it's kind of bleeding edge or new, new work and it's, it's ab above the standard. I guess you always have to be conscious of unintended qu consequences that can happen if you're doing work that's maybe not been tested before. Um, and some of the things there is just like smaller foot plates or floor plates on buildings. Um, what that might do is, is change the size, the square footage of the units and, and uh, get people chasing kind of the, the actual efficiencies of the building. And then you'll lose efficiencies with stairs and elevators, again, increasing the cost per unit. Um, we would comment on the, the kind of removing the angular plane as a positive in Williamsville as it's found not to be easily implemented. Um, the one item that, that is, came up <clears throat> 20 times throughout the, doc, the document is economic analysis. Um, and as, a, as a developers, they, they live and breathe the economics on their, on their buildings, and it's very important to them. Um, so I, I think that's one thing that, that the group needs to kind of go back and say, you know, what, maybe <clears throat> provide the scope to, the scope of the land economics to, the, uh, the stakeholders so they can review it, make sure it's coinciding with what should be done on this side of things. And then also have a good time period for, uh, for the review of that report as well. Um, the other thing is uh, bike parking <clears throat> and above grade parking. Above grade parking in suburban areas, we typically would like to continue that. Um, in bike parking, we're, we're seeing ratios of one to one. Um, I know it's not a, hot, a, a big topic in this, but um, we're seeing that that's not an actual usage in, in buildings right now, one-to-one -one bike parking. So there could be options for working on that. <clears throat> and the other thing is the actual speed 
uh, for zoning approvals and permitting. That is a crucial element to most developers. Um, and the other last thing I want to note, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the premise of the report is, is on climate change and, and taking steps to, uh, you know, to be better with that. And, and that, I applaud council for, for doing that. And that's a, it's a really tough one. It's a super tough one. and does rely on transport and buildings. Um, but we didn't really see much of that in the report. It did comment on it a little bit, but it didn't, didn't kind of dig into the details of like, you know, how is this really gonna, how are these policies going to impact greenhouse gas emissions? Um, it doesn't kind of get into that. Because one thing you can say that you're gonna have less cars, but all cars are probably gonna be electric in 10 to 15 years. So, it's a, so you kind of, un, again, an unintended consequence um, as all auto, every automotive uh, company in the world is, is going to produce electric cars. And, and not internal combustion cars in the future. So, um, so thank you. It was a good report, and we appreciate allowing the comments. Thank you. Um, now, uh, Meredith McDonnell, or McDonnell. I never know how to properly pronounce that. <laughs> thank you. Hello. Yes, Meredith I'm McDonnell, and I'm the current chair of the Sydenham District Association. Um, I appreciate you. Uh, planners uh, for coming forward and doing this policy, um, and we have some comments regarding this. Um, inform residents and uh, district association members and the leadership have been involved and supportive of the city's direction in the last five to six years to update planning and zoning bylaws that are desperately needing to be done. We absolutely uh, support the intent of the materials in this policy. Um, report and the direction of mid-rise and tall building uh, issues in this. Um, we also really appreciate the opportunity to both have had the meetings, the stakeholder meetings, have this opportunity to talk to you about some of our concerns that are still there and have continued feedback in the next months uh, regarding this. Um, so our question basically was why do we need this policy? Um, and it really is truly because we're trying to preserve the livability and some of the character of this city and what brings us all to come to downtown, much like they were saying um, for tourism. Mid-rise and large-scale buildings must be in well-placed and well-designed with human environment uh, in mind to be successful. It's important that we, we need more housing, we understand that, but we need more housing for all. So accessible housing, affordable housing, central housing to where most of us work, and also housing for the part-time part residents that are attending Queens and St. Lawrence College. Suburban sprawl increases the amount of car dependency and is not only bad for our health, but also for our environment. And I understand that electric cars are coming but you still also have increased time for commuting regardless of the electric car that actually has direct impacts on your health. It's really important that we do this policy correctly. The character and the heritage aspect of our city is what makes our city great. And with careful planning to make sure that this heritage and the character of the new versus old is not lost with new large-scale growth and development that doesn't promote pedestrians walking to work, biking to work, or actually being able to spend time outdoors when it is nice is gonna have a negative impact on the feel of our city. Well-designed, appropriately scaled, and thoughtfully sited buildings will make our city more beautiful while poorly planned and poorly designed large-scale buildings that loom large in the skyline, flatten the pedestrian experience, and make us shake our heads in the future and why something like this was built is why this policy is coming. I think it is important that we look at the financial impact on the developers and also in the neighborhoods as well. We are conscious that there are certain areas of this map that seem like they don't fit and are not suitable for mid to high rise. Um, and I think we need to delve more into that. As well, we've got concerns that the recently proposed greenlit areas, um, some are, we think, better than others for actually um, doing high rise and mid rise. Um, sorry, I just wanna make sure I don't miss anything in all my slides. Uh, these slides will come out to you guys as well. 
Um, we really want to increase the acti active transportation and walkability of our city. One of the reasons most of us choose to live in Sydenham is not to have um, smaller you know, houses and smaller properties, but is to be able to have the walkability and livability. And so we just need to make sure that we can actually preserve that and promote that. We think that old meets new and mixed use infill will improve our city and thus this policy can really help guide the proper infill and development for the future. We do not, however, agree that the policy should not uh, affect the design of four to six story buildings that possibly are wood constructed. I think the policy should actually be expanded so that it can actually have a design impact for those, those smaller mid-rise buildings that uh, will increase density. We are looking forward to continuing to work with our planning department and the city in this initiative to make Kingston a better place um, lastly, we don't want the conversation of where to and where not to to overshadow the importance of how to actually design these buildings is what I think we are looking for in this policy. We want to have people have a better living experience and be more central and have a shorter commute time um, and again have more active transportation. All right. Um, we need more time to look into the green light areas or green lit areas um, and look at scaling back some of the map to see the best places to uh, have the infill. But we very much thank the planning committee and you guys for taking this on. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark Tao from KHBA. Thank you to members of council and staff for uh, presentation and questions. Uh, as is stated, I'm here on behalf of the Kingston Home Builders Association. Um, the Home Builders, for those of you who don't know, is a group of approximately 200 uh, builders, tradespeople, um, consultants who have been building homes and involved in home building in the Kingston community for over 50 years. Uh, they represent all forms of, uh, of home building from single family homes up to apartments. So we uh, had the opportunity to meet with the uh, staff who presented the report to us, uh, the findings of the report to us on Tuesday. Um, and we've also had the chance to review and provide uh, some initial feedback. And so the, the comments prepared tonight are a uh, collaboration of feedback from the members uh, based on the review to date. So we, uh, in initial impressions in terms of positive takeaways, um, we, we believe these policies are important to the city uh, to provide certainty for both the public as well as to the development community and home builders. Um, it's an important piece in the updating and modernization of the zoning bylaw. And it's also, as has been said already, it considers the economic um, feasibility of the recommendations, uh, which is important uh, to a document such as this. Some of our key concerns, um, as was spoken to already, the economic analysis um, needs to be fully vetted before drafting the policies. Um, there are a lot of resources uh, within the community, including within the Home Builders Association who have local experience, uh, whose input would be invaluable in informing the outcome of the study. Uh, money of the items that were considered will increase the cost of housing and how does this respond to housing shortages and housing affordability in the community. And that should be considered as well. It's a very substantive document that although there have been conversations with developers with the community over a number of years on this topic, um, there is concern about certain directions being predetermined at this point given the uh, detail of some of the the analysis and some of the recommendations are coming out of it. We also noted that the report uses some phrases like strong public feedback um, in development of some of these policies, but it's not clear how 
uh, unassociated general public input was uh, obtained to date. Um, looking around the room and being involved in these types of things, a lot of the people who come out to these, a lot of the people who provide input are what we call you know, the usual parties, uh, special interest groups, including groups like the home builders. And a policy like this will have far-reaching impact on the public in terms of availability of housing for them and the affordability of housing. So the city should um, make an extra effort, I guess, in this case, to look at how to reach out to these uh, non-special interest members of the public as well. There is some concern about the phrase that referred to potential use of an interim control bylaw, again, to um, forestall development, uh, should there be appeals of any policies that are implemented. We're concerned that this would have a detrimental impact on housing supply in the city, and also that it might be an inappropriate use of an interim control bylaw, given the circumstances. Um, we do applaud the um, looking for areas that could accommodate or where areas uh, could be greenlit for development, but we do encourage staff to examine these areas closely as faulty assumptions about the suitability or the affordability of developing these areas could undermine the policy outcomes or the intended outcomes of the policies. As some of the other previous speakers spoke to, uh, we do, I think, need to have a better understanding of the housing data that's being relied upon, as this, again, is informing the policies. And the uh, discussion about revisiting intensification targets should be considered in light of the updated OP and the housing strategy, and a question of will supply, the type of supply match the uh, demand in the community. There are also unknown impacts about prioritization of wood frame construction. Uh, there are limitations on what that form of construction can do. Uh, there's also limitation on the density that can be provided. And as many of you are aware, there's a great strain on um, trades in the community, including wood frame or uh, framing uh, trades. So if there's a push towards wood frame construction, what impact would that have on other types of construction in the community? Um, including ground-oriented housing that relies on those types of trades. So some of our early suggestions based on our review over the past several days, um, one is to revisit the decision to defer study of parking requirements. The building design is an integral part, or parking in the building design is an integral part of, of what makes a building work, including the cost and how it will function. We're also encouraging the city to uh, seek meaningful input on a broad spectrum in the community. Uh, typical approaches tend to result in feedbacks from all the usual suspects and not the general public at large who will be the one most ultimately impacted by these policies. And although timing is important, it, this is an important document as well, and we urge the city to strike a balance between expediency and getting it right. Um, and we'd also finally encourage uh, the city to reach out to the Home Builders, Kingston Construction Association, other uh, local experts who would have a uh, long time knowledge about uh, the community and how and what it takes to develop and build, and that that could be uh, a valuable contribution to the economic analysis that will inform the policy. That's everything. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Frank Dixon is, and that's the last name on my list. Anybody else? Uh, I, I'll give you an opportunity right after the last person on the list speaks. So. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. 495 Alfred, apartment 2, K7K, 4J4. So I'm not here on behalf of any organization, just a regular uh, resident of the city. So I'm going to start by praising the report and the presentation tonight and the questions from the committee as well as the present presentations from speakers so far. I think the work is timely, sophisticated, innovative, and vitally important. So it's impressive that Kingston is taking a pioneering approach. Since we take pride in being an innovative city with a model of where history and innovation thrive. So this is a practical realization of that. 
So I'm going to write this up and I'll send it in to the clerk so he can um, get the information and take, take notes. So I have a, a number of questions. Um, are we working on an integration of the former Kingston Penitentiary uh, project site with this work? This is some very tall buildings that have been proposed on that site, which is a heritage zone and, as we have seen, a major tourist attraction. So this is groundbreaking futurism at work in our city, and we have usually seen piecemeal, silo-wise, fragmented, and multiple neighborhood-related uh, considerations so far. So the integration of all of these uh, aspects together, heretofore considered uh, usually separately, that's a major step forward. That's really, really tremendous to see. Um, my highest praise to that uh, level of, of thinking. So in general, we have to emphasize and value heritage and the livability elements of our historic downtown, while also boosting density and maximizing the use of infrastructure which is already in place. And my conclusion is that I would oppose any new buildings of greater than 12 stories in downtown Kingston. We have a framework which is unique in Canada where we have an 1800s era um, neighborhood around us. I'm in agreement with new buildings of 20 plus stories in certain special locations. And I'm going to itemize a few of those. For example, the southwest corner of the Kingston Center, which is currently vacant. Um, along Sir Johnny McDonald, which to me seems to be a unmentioned uh, potential. Um, along John Connor Boulevard, is also potential for uh, increased density. 30 seconds. Okay. I'm going to uh, just say one thing. I do resent from an earlier speaker the use of the phrase usual suspects. I think that's inappropriate in this setting. My remaining comments will be sent to the clerk by email. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe there's a gentleman here that would like to speak. Uh, would you like to raise your hand if you uh, would like to speak? Uh, seeing none, I'll ask again. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of council, uh, staff, and uh, residents of our great city of Kingston that are here tonight. My name is Paul Martin. I'm a member of the Kingston Home Builder Association and also a housing provider. I'm excited and delighted to hear that we all want to work together to put this policy in place. We've got a declaration of climate emergency and affordable housing. They're two pretty tall bills to try to work with, and I admire this council for taking on that challenge. From the building aspect, which there's a lot of knowledge here in this room because we're concerned, we would like to try to be more proactive and work closer with your staff in making sure that these studies, and in particular the economic aspect of it, are flushed out properly so that we do have an appreciation for what some of these policies that are about to be put in place, what their long-term effects are gonna be. Not, not only on us as the providers, but as our community, as the people that are gonna to have to live in these homes and in these places, and, and what that cost means to the people that we're going to be trying to provide this housing for. And it is tricky, it is hard. Affordable accommodation, that is a huge, huge bill to try to fill for any community. And then climate change. Wow, 
One of the things that I would like to try to see our council, again, work with us on, is a plan. How do we put a plan in place? It's nice to say that we've got an emergency. And I agree, we do. Not just for Kingston, of course, but for the whole world. That said, how do we make sure, working together, that we do do it properly? And again, you know, uh, uh, I'm being a little bit facetious here, but I, 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 Brent, don't get me wrong here, but you talk about cutting edge. We want to be cutting edge. I just want to make sure we don't get hurt being cutting edge. Um, I, I think it's really important that we do take our time in putting this together, that we do, again, try to include, in particular, the community, but also the home builders that are providing this particular type of housing to our community. Let me give you a quick example. Um, the Ontario Accessibility for Disability Act. Do you know what that cost has put in to homes and affordability of homes? It's huge. Is it important? I believe it is. And we will work together through that to accommodate those things. Uh, our fire code, constantly changing. Um, when we were building apartments, as an example, we used to never put sprinklers in. Well, now it's a necessity. Well, that added an extra $500,000 into a 10-story building that wasn't there before. And at the end of the day, unfortunately, and I'll wrap up here in a second, I'm sorry, that it's the people that are going to have to live in these accommodations that are going to have to pay for it. And they're not here today, but I can guarantee once we provide the product, if it's not affordable, don't get me wrong, you councillors, but you may not be here. Thank you very much. And I do want to work together. That's very important. Thank Please you. allow us, as the Home Builder Association, to help in formulating the economics of what's being presented. Thank, Thank you, you very much. You will have that input. So, uh, I believe I saw Mr. Gaventer waving at me a minute ago, so. Thank you for, uh, thank you for the report. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I wasn't intending to speak, but some of the comments that were made prompted me to speak. Uh, first of all, the, the number of people addressing the, the meeting who were from the building community and development community, um, and some of them who uh, I felt demeaned or, or uh, the, uh, the uh, contribution of the associated people worried me. The, the speaker who preceded me just immediately, I appreciate what he said. I'm comfortable with, with, with his presentation. I agree with, what, with much of what he said. The needs of the develop of the of the trades and of, uh, the needs of the um, people doing the building need to be taken into account. However, there's another vision or another perspective. The, the, the uh, developers have a very immediate kind of uh, perspective, mostly, because they have to make a profit, and they have to, and 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 uh, what level of profit becomes. Uh, they're, they're motivated to make a, as large, large a profit as possible, and that's reasonable in our society. So those of us who are, unas who are associated often have spent a lot of time looking at the issues. We spend a lot of time reading the, the, li the literature and reading the um, reports, and we are in touch with our communities. But we also, and we often are bringing a longer term perspective of the city. So there's a strain, I want to give you an example of that strain, I'll be trying to make it short. The sense of how important it is to defend the central, the historic nature of the central business district uh, is a higher priority for many of us, may, uh, maybe a higher priority for many of us who are associated. And uh, 
but, uh, for, but the business community often sees the immediate profit capacity of that area, which sometimes puts at risk the historical area. Now, for example, from my point of view, I, uh, in my submission to the task force, uh, Mayor's task force on housing, I emphasized the need. I, I said we should have uh, bring pressure to bear on uh, when we encourage development to try and get affordable units into the. But then I said, but even if that were not true, if the, even if we weren't going to get the affordable housing, it is important to do what you're doing, which is to make the right of uh, the the matter of right uh, to build in place and people know that, so developers know where they stand so they can do it more efficiently and at a lower cost. So I said that because I recognize that. Um, but I do think that there are many development opportunities out that are on the border, I, thank you, I'm almost done, on the border of the uh, district and, and don't have to be right in the center of the district. And in my work uh, on Kings Court uh, area where I, made submissions, I pointed out a large number of locations where there was land that, and, and places where we could have higher density. So we, we can address this problem, we can create possibilities by cooperating and, and, and uh, being aware of each other and needs, but also by, by respecting the, the uh, different perspectives we're bringing to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, last call, if there are any other speakers on this issue. Uh, seeing none, I want to thank all everybody uh, for a very civil discussion. Uh, I'm going to go back into the committee in case there's any comments or questions. Yes, Councillor Hill, and then Councillor Cobb. I, I guess just uh, for uh, clarifying that there will be an offer, uh uh, developers and members of the community to comment on the on the uh, fiscal analysis when it comes out. Thank you, and through you, so definitely yes. When the work is is been completed um, in terms of of drafting the document, just like we do with any other supporting documentation, we will make it available and happy to have conversations with people to go over the information. Councillor Kiley, then Councillor Chappelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, and I'm going to put you on the spot if you don't mind. We've heard tonight from a number of developers in our community that should certain proposals in this document or some form of them, when the document is completed, be advanced, they will effectively pass down the costs of making those changes to tenants. I'm wondering in your experience across the world if there are any jurisdictions which have mechanisms that prevent that downloading to tenants from developers when cities ask for better buildings. And again, apologies for putting you on the spot. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, I, I want to be careful not to over, overstate this because circumstances are never the same in two different places. But generally, uh, what we find in city after city is that when expectations change, uh, there is an initial, uh, usually an initial impact on viability of projects depending on when property was purchased, uh, when various uh, uh, conditions of the economic situation are, are locked in place, and there's a certain period where, where, where people may be caught in the middle of that transaction. And that's, it's sort of inevitable, and, and municipalities can, can buffer it if, if, if they, if they uh, feel the need to, but it's kind of like uh, how anytime the rules change, there are certain people that are going to be affected by it. Over the long term, if you provide clarity, and that's the most important thing about what is allowed and not allowed, over the longer term, uh, the, the, the costs associated with the new requirements, in my, in my experience and the experience of experts who I've worked with over my career who are much smarter than me at this, um, uh, show that it does not get passed on to the purchaser or the renter unless the economic conditions support higher prices. In other words, it never passes on to the renter or the buyer unless the renter or buyer is prepared to pay more. And actually that is more determined by issues of supply and demand, including how many units are available and your vacancy rates, 
than it is determined by your actual requirements. What tends to happen in those circumstances is land value gets pushed down before prices go up. But again, it takes a while for all of those things to equalize, so there's often a period where that doesn't happen on a dime. And um, with all due respect to the, the parties that have, have spoken, I'm usually quick to push uh, out this information quickly because the narrative is usually anytime you require uh, something new from City Hall, whether it's an affordability requirement or new design, that it's always going to contribute to affordability gets, because it gets pushed onto the purchaser. That can sometimes happen in the short term if the market is actually willing to pay more. If not, what tends to happen is the prices still get determined by supply and demand, will still get more affected by the actual vacancy rate and issues like that, and over time, land value will de decrease in order to respond to those new expectations. Just like, by the way, if changes on the private sector side happen, like concrete goes up in price, or, or the expectations of the bank in terms of financing change. Those don't necessarily automatically get passed on to the purchaser or renter either, unless the purchaser and the renter are prepared to pay more because of supply and demand. Does that help? It helps, and I think it's a question that will continue. Thank you. Thank you. Chappelle. Looking at the density by design proposal, um, certainly focusing on wood, will that preclude any developer from choosing to use concrete? Thank you. So it's certainly not the intention for us to preclude any form of development by way of this policy. Definitely we're looking at understanding the differences between wood frame and concrete and make sure that the understanding of that is reflected in what the, the long-term policy implications are going to be, but it's definitely not the intention in any way. And if, there's, if there has been the perception that this work is about saying we don't need more housing, that's not what this work is about. We actually know that we need more housing. So this is about where does the housing go to some extent, and more importantly, the focus of this is how does it look from a mid-rise and tall perspective. So definitely it's not the intention for us to create any type of policy expectation that eliminates a building form from the market. Thank you. Any further questions? Yes, Councillor Hutchison. This is comments too, as well as questions. Okay, my first question has to do, and this is following up on uh, Councillor Hill's question. Um, we heard from a couple of um, um, of the public, namely developers, mostly or representatives, that they could benefit from an extension of the deadline for comments. So I'm asking if we can do that. It seems to make sense to me, especially since the, the, the uh, festive season is coming up and people will not hopefully be reading too much of this for at least a couple of weeks. So um, is that possible? Thank you and through you, Mr. Chair. Definitely we have heard that feedback as part of the consultations that we've undertaken this week so far. And again, it's come up tonight. Uh, what the team would like to do is have an opportunity to reflect upon that and then come back with a bit of a plan that would include, uh, include a revised timeline or an extended timeline for consultation. I don't want to just blindly make that, com that um, commitment right now, but with a commitment to come back next week and to be able to provide some additional information on that after we've had a chance to regroup, but certainly it's possible. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I think I wanted to say something about, yes, I think the city is willing to work together. I'm certainly sure that's true of staff and, and council. Um, one of the things about that that didn't get mentioned today, but I know staff know about, and that is the importance. We were talking about demand and, the, and beneath that, as well as the other factors identified in the report, is the need for immigration including immigration in our country, in our city because of the need to sustain demand, to fill jobs, and so on. And it seems to me it gets too often ignored that um, uh, immigrants in particular, I know this from my own experience in the housing field, look to rent first. It's just not me that thinks that, until they suss out a 
uh, community and see whether they can afford to buy or whether they're going to be able to be established and so on. So when we don't supply the right kind of housing, including affordable housing, we are hurting ourselves. We know we're doing that. I've talked to staff about it, or they've talked to us as a council, that we have trouble filling certain types of jobs. The private sector has complained about not being able to get and retain planners, and the city also complains. Part of that equation is housing and housing that can be afforded by the type of people that you're trying to hire. Some of them might be well paid, but those people always need supporting people who are less well paid. So I just want to point out that's part of working together is recognizing that we must, as a community, supply that kind of housing. It's economically necessary. The other thing I wanted to say, <clears throat> And I, I'm not, I don't mean this as chiding whatsoever, but I've talked to a couple of developers and their representatives and pointed out that for council, council people, um, councillors, and, and including staff, I suspect, it, 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 that is about the, what I call the inability of council to really appreciate what the costs are and motivation, cost motivations are of developers, because we don't know what their business economic analysis is. To those developer representatives, two or three of them in, in the room tonight, it's a black box to councillors and to staff. So what that's prompted, in part, is we want an economic analysis to tell us really what's going on. So to the private development industry, I would say the more, if you could find your way to share more of the way in which you analyze things in a reasonable way to us, that would facilitate this process. And that's because we all know you have to make a profit. We all know that. The question is how much, where? Right? This is part of the issue. And I realize that you think of that as proprietary, proprietary information, and I understand that too. I've worked in the private sector. You don't go around telling everybody what you're doing and for competitive reasons. But somehow we have to get around that because even if you have say into the economic analysis, we have to have some notion about whether it's accurate and, um, and, and is pertinent. So, just saying that, and if we're going to give up values, other values like heritage values or affordability, I think responsible counselor needs to know what we're getting for that and whether we are getting something that outweighs that. And the problem in the community is they don't think they're getting that information. They don't agree that giving up what they consider a, a deep value in, say, heritage is by having imposing uh, buildings in the way um, is, is, is worth it. So that analysis has to be done, that thinking has to be done. And without proper numbers, how can you do it? So I applaud staff and the consultant not that I haven't known for months, but <laughs> they have recognized we have to do that. But I say to the, the private developers, we respect what you do, but these are the balances that we have to take into account. It's really, it's difficult, as was recognized and well stated, it's really difficult because we are responding, you might think, oh, they're abjured, they don't understand. We have to try and balance all these interests, and it's not easy. It drives staff crazy sometimes, and counselors. So I just want to make that clear and say to everyone, we're going to work together. We can. We have to recognize what the other person, other organization, business and government have to take into account. Otherwise, we're never going to get anywhere, and we need to get someplace. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments from the committee? Would you take the chair? Take the chair and recognize. A couple of things. Um, there was mention of the usual suspects. I joked six out of the nine 
speakers tonight were developers or supporters of developers. So uh, the usual suspects appear to be developers. And I, with all due respect, that isn't meant as an insult, but it's the reality. Yes, we've had public meetings, and we've had good terms. Point of order, how is this relevant? I'm, I'm trying to explain uh, the point. So if you want to challenge the chair or make a comment, no. so. Let, let the counselor finish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yes, we, we've met and set up meetings with community associations. I wish there were more community associations in Kingston. We, we have had public meetings and heard from the public. One of the realities of municipal government is in the preparation of policy, we sometimes don't get huge turnouts. And then a policy is made and then we get uh, a number of people who come and talk about that. And that's a frustration at times, but it's a reality. I just want to point out a couple of the statistics that are there and one that isn't. This year, again, we're approaching almost 1,000 units. And by the end of the year, we may have 1,000 units or more of, of uh, residences developed within the community. I want to remind people, yes, we have a really disturbing vacancy rate. Nobody can argue with that. But we have over 5,000 approved units. And many of those approved units are with some of the developers that are here tonight. And we also have within in the uh, a process right now that amount again. So right now there's eight years supply of housing. Already approved, needs to be built. We have almost that number again uh, that would put us into 15 or 16 years of, of uh, supply. So yes, we need more, more units. Yes, rents are driven up because of the low vacancy rate. The city has approved a number of, uh, a large number of units. And there's all kinds of people that could go tomorrow and get a building permit for those. And so, so that's my plea, <laughs> is before uh, there's a whole series of pushback against a new policy, take a look at what's already been approved. And please, let's lower our vacant, uh, or inc increase uh, the number of units available uh, by building what's already been approved. Sorry, that was a bit of a rant, but thank you. Would you like back? Um, seeing no further uh, members of the committee, I will, we will move on to uh, we have no motions. We have no notices of motion. Any other business? Seeing none. Uh, the correspondence has already been supplied. Uh, date and time of the next meeting, December 5th at 6.30 in this room. So, and now a motion to adjourn. Moved and seconded. Pick of the litter, everybody rose their, raised their hand. All those in favor? Carried. <laughs>